The Senate will come to order. Senator Murphy. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning. I impose a call of the Senate. The Senate is now under call.
Senator Murphy. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that further proceedings under the roll call be dispensed with and that the Sergeant at Arms be instructed to bring in the absent members. On that motion, all in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. <laughs> members, if you'd be so kind as to stand. In our tradition, we start with the prayer by the chaplain, and today's chaplain is Pastor Ruthie Mhanga from Gustavus Adolphus Lutheran Church in St. Paul. Needless to say, but as a friendly reminder, following the prayer, please remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Holy and gracious God, we come before you with humility, knowing that our human systems of how we live together are not perfect. We also come before you with gratitude, trusting that you are still at work in us and through us because of your deep love for humanity and creation. We come expectant that you will reveal the brokenness and guide us forward on a new path where we, with our families and communities and world, can experience life and healing and wholeness. We pray for the work of the Senate. Open the eyes and ears and hearts of those gathered here for the work that can only be done in connection with one another and in connection with those they are called to serve. In your holy and gracious name we pray. Amen. Thank you, members. The secretary will take the roll. Abler, Anderson, Barr, Bolden, Carlson, Champion, Coleman, Swadzinski, Dames, Dibble, Dornick, Dreheim, Draskowski, Duckworth, Diedzik, Eichhorn, Farnsworth, Fateh, Frentz, Green, Grunhagen, Gustafson, Hoschild, Herr, Hoffman, Housley, Howe, Jasinski, Johnson, Klein, Coran, Kroon, Kunish, Kupek, Lang, Latz, Liskey, Limmer, Lucero, Mann, Marty, Matthews, McQuaid, McEwen, Miller, Mitchell, Mohammed, Morrison, Murphy, Nelson, Umover, Baton, Pappas, Pa, Port, Pratt, Putnam, Rarick, Rasmussen, Rest, Seeberger, Utke, Weber, Wiesenberg, Westland, Westrum, Wickland, Zhang. Members, a quorum is present. The following members intend to vote from a remote location under Rule 40.7, Senator Desick and Port. As usual, members, if you want to follow along, I will go through the Senate agenda, which is dated Thursday, April 4th. We will begin at the fifth order of business, reports of committees. There's a report to read at the desk. The secretary will read the report. Senator Marty from the Committee on Finance, to which was referred House File Number 3613, a bill for an act relating to transportation, providing for clarifications on forecasted metro mobility funding. Amended pursuant to Rule 45, adopted by the Senate March 21, 2024, the text of House File Number 3613 is identical to Senate File Number 3660. Reports the same back with a recommendation that the bill be amended as follows. And when so amended, the bill do pass. Senator Murphy for a motion to adopt the committee reports. Thank you, Mr. President. I move the committee reports printed in the agenda and read by the secretary be adopted. On that motion, all in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. <laughs> Members, we will now proceed to the seventh order of business, which is second reading of House bills. The secretary will read the House file numbers. House file numbers 3589, 3925, 4109, 4457, and 3613. The House files have been given their second reading. <laughs> Members, we will now proceed to the eighth order of business, which is the introduction and first reading of Senate bills. The bills listed on today's introduction calendar are given their first reading and referred as indicated. 
Remember, there's one change. If you go to page five, and at page five, you will notice Senate file number 5327, and that bill has been referred to the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety. As I mentioned, members, the bills listed on today's introduction calendar are given their first reading and referred as indicated. <laughs> members, we will now proceed to the ninth order of business, which is motions and resolutions. We will adopt the author's motion as one motion. All in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. We will now go to individual senators' motions. I'm going to start today with Senator Fate. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, I move that Senate File 3123 be withdrawn from the Committee on Human Services and re refer to the Committee on Health and Human Services. And Senator Fate, you've, uh, you've spoken to both chairs, is that correct? Correct. Thank you, Senator Fate. Senator Fate moves that Senate File number 3123 be withdrawn from the Committee on Human Services and re refer to the Committee on Health and Human Services. On that motion, all in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. We will now go to Senator Klein. Mr. President, I, uh, pursuant to Rule 5.1, uh, I move that Senate File 2003 be withdrawn from the Committee on Finance, given a second reading, and placed on general orders. I'm the author of the bill, and I've spoken to Chair Marty. Any discussions on that motion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. The secretary will read Senate file number 2003. Senate file number 2003. The Senate, the Senate has been, the, the Senate bill has been given its second reading. <laughs> Members, we will now Consider resolution number 87, which will be referred to the Committee on Rules and Administration. And remember, members, there's no action required on that move. I will now go to Senate, uh, Senator Murphy. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I move we recess to the call of the President. On that motion, all in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, today I'm honored to stand in front of the body uh, to give recognition uh, to our Colonel Langer, Matt Langer of the State Patrol uh, today. Uh, Colonel Langer's last day will be tomorrow. Uh, so I have a Senate resolution I'd like to read in, in a moment. Uh, but I've had the pr uh, privilege and honor to work with Senator, or I'm sorry, uh, Colonel Langer uh, in my last eight years uh, working on the Transportation Committee. Uh, on April 1st, on Monday, they had a, a retirement uh, celebration for him at Fort Snelling, and uh, it was fun to talk and see many of his peers and, and people from across the state who showed up to honor uh, Colonel Matt Langer. Uh, the things that came to mind uh, that I heard from many, many people were his professionalism and his kindness. And that's something that stands out about Colonel Langer uh, that I will never forget. Uh, so we have a few members that like to speak today, so I'm not going to go on too much longer. Uh, but I want to thank uh, Colonel Langer for his service and his family uh, for allowing him to serve for us. Uh, so with that, I'll read the resolution, and then we have a couple of members who'd like to speak. So uh, on behalf of the Minnesota Senate, I am honored and privileged to present a Senate resolution SR number 80, expressing gratitude to Colonel Matt Langer for nearly 25 years of service with the Minnesota State Patrol. Whereas Matt Langer joined the Minnesota State Patrol in 1999 as a trooper working out of the St. Paul Station, and whereas he spent time on the Metro, tra Metro Crash Reconstruction Team and was the director of the State Patrol's fleet and asset management section uh, before moving up to captain. And whereas after serving as the Assistant Chief and Acting Chief, Matt was appointed Colonel Chief of the State Patrol in January of 2015. At this time, I'd like to yield the floor to Senator Dibble. 
Senator uh, Dibbo. Thank you, Mr. President. And whereas Colonel Langer's accomplishments with the State Patrol include growing an internal peer support team, reestablishing a chaplaincy program, forming and progressing the crash reconstruction specialty area, helping advocate for passage of Minnesota's hands-free statute in, in 2019, and signing a pledge to increase the number of female troopers and support staff to 30 percent by 2030. Sen Thank Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. And whereas under Colonel Langer's leadership, the State Patrol has focused its education and enforcement efforts on preventing driving that leads to fatal crashes, including initiative against street racing and heat patrols against speeding and criminal ac activity. Minnesota roads are now the third safest in the country. And whereas Colonel Langer is leaving the State Patrol to become the Director of Global Policing for the International Association of Chiefs of Police, and now therefore be it resolved by the Senate of the State of Minnesota, that wishes Colonel Langer the best in his new position and thanks him for service to the Department of the Public Safety and the Minnesota State Patrol. With that, I'd like to yield back to Senator Dibble and a few other members. Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, and I just wanted to add a few thoughts of tribute to uh, Colonel Langer. Uh, and if you look up, you'll see him up in the gallery. He's with us today. Uh, uh, I'm just extremely grateful for Colonel Langer's professionalism, as Senator Draczynski just articulated, and his kindness. Um, I will say that, and his honesty uh, and, his, and his transparency, I'll just say that uh, on more than one occasion, I had to call Colonel Langer, uh, along with my counterpart in the House, have some difficult conversations about things that were going on in the community, in our city. Um, as you recall, we had a little bit of uh, activity in my city a few years ago, uh, a little bit of civil unrest, things happened, and we had to call and engage the Colonel, and he was just very, very available to us, uh, very responsive. Um, you know, some things happened that we weren't exactly happy with, but I, I know he did his level best to try to improve the situation there in Minneapolis, and we're grateful for that. Uh, he was always available, Senator Jasinski will attest to this, uh, for a phone call or consultation or being present in our committee to give us very good advice on policy proposals that were in front of us, particularly as related uh, to traffic safety throughout the state of Minnesota, uh, and his input helped us uh, not pass dumb ideas and make our dumb ideas better and maybe even turn them into smart ideas. Uh, and the legacy that he's going to leave, um, which I know will be of great benefit uh, to the agency and the people that the agency serves of the state of Minnesota, is what's known as CALEA, C-A-L-E-A, -E the Commission on Accreditation for Law Enforcement Agencies, uh, which we funded last year upon his initiative. Uh, and. That is an effort, a multi-year effort, in which the agency is going to embark on trying to fulfill 183 separate standards to improve the professionalism, the procedures, procedural justice, access to the citizens, uh, just a whole array of, of, of efforts uh, to make sure that the State Patrol can be uh, the optimal law enforcement agency that it can be and serve as an exemplar as it currently is for many of our local law enforcement agencies. So I wish Colonel Langer well in his future pursuits. I'm glad he's not actually leaving the state of Minnesota, so we'll probably see him around from time to time. Uh, thank you, Senator Jasinski. Uh, with that, we will yield to Senator Howe. Senator Howe. Well, thank you, and uh, I'd just like to say, uh, Colonel Langer, thank you for your 25 years of service. Thank you for your family's 25 years of service, because uh, as a public sa safety uh, servant myself in the past, I know what dedication and what sacrifice it is for both you and your family to serve in the public safety community. And uh, the one thing I'll, I'll say that I've got a good relationship with most of the troopers, and, uh, and when your name comes up, uh, it's, always, it's always mentioned in a positive manner that you've got candor, you always looked out to try to, you always tried to look out for your, your troopers. And, uh, and I always appreciated that uh, if I had a question about the troopers, if I needed guidance in what I was doing, I could call you at any time. And I appreciated the fact that you, uh, you were, had enough trust in me that you would call me if, if uh, I could help you. So I greatly appreciate it. I'm sorry to see you go, but I understand it. And uh, good luck to you in your new venture, and uh, you're always welcome back, and I always look forward to those phone calls. Thank you, Colonel. Senator Frins. Thank you, Mr. President. Colonel Langer, congratulations on 25 great years. I want to add my voice to those that appreciate the way you work, 
Um, and I want to mention something that um, you don't get enough credit for, which is towards zero deaths. Senator Dibble mentioned difficult conversations. And I've always been impressed by the State Patrol's responsibility to notify families when a loved one is lost on our highways. You have been a leader in toward zero deaths. And what I think we lose sight of is there are hundreds of families in Minnesota who never had to have that difficult conversation because you and the State Patrol's work on toward zero deaths prevented a fatal crash. They didn't get a call at 2 in the morning. They didn't get a knock on the door. And although those families aren't here to thank you and every man and woman at the State Patrol, because they don't know who they are because they didn't get that knock on the door, you can look at the numbers and you can look at the work you're doing. And we will continue that work in honor of you and everybody at the State Patrol and all the people of Minnesota. So this is one state senator saying thanks very much for all you've done. Best of luck to you. It's our loss, but their gain, Colonel. Senator Murphy. Thank you, Mr. President, Colonel Langer. Uh, I want to say thank you on behalf of the Senate for your contributions and the contributions of your family in making Minnesota safer. Uh, we're grateful for you, and we're sending you off today with hope and high expectation for your continued work. Thank you very much. And last but certainly not least, Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you again, Mr. President. Again, thank you, Colonel Langer. Uh, I wanted to do it here in the Senate where you've meant so much to us. Uh, many of us didn't get to go, many of the people didn't get to go uh, to the Fort Snelling event, so I wanted to do it here. So with that, I ask you all to stand and give uh, Senator Colonel, or Colonel Langer uh, a round of applause. Thank you, members. Thank you to the Colonel as well. With that, the Senate will come to order. <laughs> Remaining under motions of resolution, Senator Murphy. Thank you, Mr. President. Pursuant to Rule 26, I designate the following bills be made special orders for immediate consideration. Members, the list is on your desk. Thank you so much, Senator Murphy. That is correct. The special orders list is on your desk. We will begin today with Senate file number 4399. I am uh, yielding to and calling on Senator Hoffman for the Omnibus Human Services Policy Bill. Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, the Human Services Policy Omnibus Bill is the culmination of our extensive bipartisan collaboration. And to begin, I want to uh, pass the A23 author's technical amendment that resolves the fiscal issues that we identified in our committee by staff and by the department. Senator Hoffman offers the A23 amendment. The secretary will read and report the A23 amendment. Senator Hoffman moves to amend Senate file number 4399 as follows. Page, pages 13 to 14 delete sections 12 to 15. This is the A23 amendment. Senator Hoffman, to your A23 amendment. Thank you, Mr. President and members. As you know, this is a policy bill, and so we don't want to have finance fiscal intertwined with policy, although it is hard to do within human services because it's all intertwined. But in this case, uh, we had made that commitment to one another in our committee that said if any of our provisions end up having a fiscal note attached to it, we need to remove it on the floor versus going in front of uh, finance and in front of rules, so we just are removing that provisions on the floor, and that's what we're doing here, Mr. President. So I would uh, vote for a yes, please. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, say aye. aye. All opposed, say no. The motion prevails, and the A23 is adopted. <laughs> Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. President. There's one more. There's an A32 amendment that should be there as well. Senator Hoffman offers the A32 amendment. The secretary will report the A32 amendment. Senator Hoffman moves to amend Senate file number 4399 as follows. Page 80, lines 16 to 24, delete the new language. This is the A32 amendment. 
Senator uh, Hoffman to your, A your A32 amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. In yesterday's committee hearing, um, it was brought to our attention that there was one provision within the bill that perhaps might have a cost to it. And again, we had the conversation as a committee and said if there is a cost under signed for that, then what we will need to do is remove that provision from the floor, which we did. Uh, here in this amendment, and it'll get rolled into our budget bill. So with that, Mr. President, I think Senator from uh, Anoka wants to say something. Senator Abler to the A32 amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. I actually met, offered, was going to make, make a comment on the previous amendment, which I'll make on this one as well. I, um, these are amendments that are we've worked on on a collegial basis, and I want to, just before we get too far into the bill, to thank Senator Hoffman for his, uh, his good leadership on the committee. Um, the effort in the Senate over the last uh, good amount of time has been to work on the policy of this as caring about individuals with substance issues, uh, long-term care needs, um, and so on, and uh, his leadership has been very strong on that. Um, the, uh, he was very inclusive in having uh, members with uh, bills on both sides of the aisle. And uh, if it was a good idea, it went in. If it wasn't a good idea, it didn't go. And we're sorting through a few more things yet in the bill. Uh, this amendment is a part of the agreement that we made in a very uh, collaborative way to, uh, to get a good bill off the floor and on the way. So thank you, Mr. Pre I urge members to vote yes. Any other discussion on the A32 amendment? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. All opposed say no. The motion prevails and the A32 amendment is adopted. Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you to the good Senator from Anoka for your kind words. You actually set this uh, committee up six years ago when you took over chair to make sure that we did, in the words of Jim Ramstead, keep our egos in the hallway and really work on what is nonpartisan. It's really about common sense and pragmatic. So with that, there was one more provision that our committee did talk about, Mr. President, and that is the A33 amendment. Senator Hoffman offers the A33 amendment. The secretary will report the A33 amendment. Senator Hoffman moves to amend Senate file number 4399 as follows. Page 104, delete section 6 and insert. This is the A33 amendment. Senator Hoffman to your A33 amendment. Thank you, Mr. President, and members, as you well know, there's health and human services and there's human services. And in the health and human services, sometimes there's a correlation of work that we're doing. And in this case, there were some provisions in reports that were sunsetting. Um, however, within our health and human services uh, provisions, Senator Wicklin's amendment, this really wants to keep those uh, provisions, those reports within the HHS, HHS bill, Mr. President. And this just aligns the needs of that committee uh, with what we're doing here today. So thank you. Please vote yes. Any other discussion on the A33 amendment? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. All opposed say no. The motion prevails and the A33 amendment is adopted. Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. President. When you look at the bill, there are six articles. I'm going to go through each article uh, work by work, line by line, just so we can spend the next eight hours having a discussion on what's important to the state of Minnesota. But those six articles, there are 95 sections. And so we did work as a group. And there was some disagreement, but it was amazing to see how you could disagree with a policy or disagree with a provision without making it personal, Mr. President. And so with that, uh, the omnibus bill, really the culmination, some of the highlights. I'm just going to hit some of the highlights, and they are what Senator Abler talked about as well, which is the nursing facility transparency accountability. There's a, a bill that we did in our group requiring nursing facility owners and operators to provide the department with a copy of their audited financial statements each year that the audit is conducted. This provides that transparency and quality of care to residents and nursing homes throughout the state, especially as you start to see a lot of these businesses being bought and sold. Um, the second thing, there's some sober home, sober home language um, that Senator Mann uh, has in this a bill, and that would be required to have a supply of the opioid receptor antagonists like naloxone on hand in an easy to see place for residents. The language really allows residents to keep their prescriptions, these are prescriptions, on them while at the sober home, which is a critical step in making recovery accessible to those, especially those with disabilities. And uh, Mr. President, there's uh, been lots of discussion. There's a bipartisan, bicameral group of people discussing, and there's probably an amendment coming from Senator Rasmussen that 
that just keeps this conversation going. So when we end up going with the House on it, the people that are really involved in this conversation will be absolutely at the table with Senator Mann and us. So you'll see that. There's also, there's a, a OTP medication changes, a Senator Kupek bill that allows clinics that are op on the opioid treatment program to dispense those individualized doses as ordered for days that the clinic is closed for business, no matter the patient's length of time. We don't need to stop the ability for somebody to get to their recommended dose of prescriptions that they need in order to stay sober or in recovery. Senator Bolden then, Mr. President, has a long-term care uh, issue addressing workforce, and those are through the remote training and development piece. Those are especially as we're looking at remote worker training and development for the CFSS workers, that training would allow those workers to continue to provide care to certain patients with chronic health conditions or those compromised immune systems via audio or visual communication. We're getting more and more into that. Um, the, the other one uh, is the, the modifications to laws that are currently prevent qualified people from working in the caregiving industry. As you are well aware, Mr. President, there are over 53,000 job openings in the caregiver bucket within the state of Minnesota. That has not changed since that came out in our previous um, committee work that we had done. But what this does is it allows people who have attained a nursing degree or a higher education in nursing to meet the qualifications to provide positive supports as a specialist or an analyst, right? It removes the language that working, it removes the language that now allows for those positive support anal analysts to only need four years of working with individuals that exhibit the challenging behavior. And this allows for quality people to help out and provide the support needed for the caregiving industry. That's a workforce issue. The other one we did is we did updates and modernize the Deaf, Deaf, Blind, and Hard of Hearing Services Act, and that's to have some better representation on that board. Um, the, the, we also go on to other highlights. Senator Utke has a home and community-based services workforce standards change that's in this bill. Senator May Quaid, medical assistance for employed persons with premium timeline and reported changes. That was really a good conversation, Mr. President. Senator Rasmussen has a streamlining and support access to assistive technology. That was also a good conversation. Senator Abler from Anoka has both the direction of DHS to engage with stakeholders in the Waiver Reimagine project. That has been around. We have a couple of years to get it right. Mr. President, and I think this is going to be our process into that same position. Then we also, Senator Abler brought up the Assistant Living Director Workforce Standard Changes, and then of course, somebody who doesn't even serve on our committee, Senator Housley from the Aspen of Minnesota, uh, has a requirement for publicly posted correction orders that required for assisted living. That's something that she actually brought up when she was chair of the um, long-term care uh, policy uh, like six years ago. And then, then we end with Senator Rasmussen with his long-term care options, counseling referral requirement and modifications. Mr. President, what this shows is this was a conversation about the needs of Minnesota. This was not about any political ramifications at all, Mr. President. So with that, I just did a highlight overview and um, I just want everybody to say yes and yes so we can get this to conference committee. So thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Hoffman. Any discussion on Senate File 4399? Uh, Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. President. And I would offer the A27 amendment at this time, and I'm happy to describe it. Senator Rasmussen offers the A27 amendment. The Secretary will report the A27 amendment. Senator Rasmussen moves to amend Senate file number 4399 as follows. Page 84, line 9, after the second comma, insert one or more. This is the A27 amendment. Senator Rasmussen, to your A27 amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, members. Uh, this amendment, which uh, Senator Hoffman uh, mentioned in his opening on the bill, would address some of the medication management requirements that this bill is putting on Minnesota, Minnesota sober homes. I really want to thank uh, Senator Mann for her expertise and work on this issue, along with Representative Baker in the other body. Um, what this amendment does is it would still uh, ensure that residents at Minnesota sober homes have access to medication used to treat substance use disorder and all non-addictive medication that are prescribed to them by their provider. 
However, it would um, allow sober homes uh, to not have a, some addictive medication be required to be on their presence. And there's some concerns from uh, sober homes, especially smaller sober homes in rural Minnesota, um, about managing addictive substances within a sober home. I know this conversation will continue uh, and just simply hope that this amendment being adopted today will help continue that conversation and the good work that Senator Mann is doing on this bill. Thank you. Senator Hoffman to think, the A27 amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. And this, this goes into that deep embedded conversation. When you got um, you know, the good senator, Dr. Mann, who understands some of the, the concerns about the mental health side of it. And, and one of the things we struggled with as a committee was to say how we can assure that everybody's gonna have access to those um, drugs or those prescriptions that are needed in order for them to fulfill their, their life skills. And so um, not knowing what the other body's doing on this, uh, Mr. President, and knowing that this conversation needs to continue, that should just be a friendly amendment, but I would like, you know, again, Senator Mann and Senator Rasmussen have been talking about this, and, and we just got to keep this conversation going. So with that, yeah, let's, let's, go to, let's go to conference committee with this uh, amendment. So I, I accept it. Any other discussion on the A27? Uh, Senator Abler. Well, thank you, Mr. President, um, and I just wanted to offer a little word about the sober home, too. There's, there's really, I think, only two main areas of, of uh, unresolution, I think, in this bill. One is this, and it's in process, and the other has to do with uh, assisted livings and those who aren't subject to licensure, and I know that's being worked on as well, but I, I think it's important for the, uh, the, the body to understand this, and, and so um, there is uh, quite a discussion about the role of medication in a sober home, uh, and some, some people are, there, there's some places that would absolutely benefit by having access to people with their addiction problems and mental health issues where they're able to get these medications, and, and some others who are totally uh, at risk for, frankly, breaking into the lockboxes and need to be in, in an abstinence-based facility. And I don't think there's any, uh, no one wants to cause harm to that, but that's, this, this amendment actually moves in the right direction toward that. I, I don't know how we strike a balance, and I'm in consultation with Senator Mann about this as it goes forward. I'm a co-author on her bill because I support the idea. Uh, but going forward, I hope that there can be a way where we can make sure that those who really want an abstinence-based program, which may be the minority of those, uh, are able to actually obtain that in the face of allowing individuals who need to get uh, these medications. And we're, we're actually short of sober home beds, but we don't want the effect of this, uh, this improvement, in, at least in some homes, to be a way that we actually lose some beds. So I see Matt, Senator Mann's gonna comment, so I'm happy for that discussion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Mann. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, everyone said my name, so I figured I should say something. Um, so times are changing, Mr. President. This is the standard of treatment now, is uh, these medications that are available and that we're seeing success with. This is the new standard of treatment and people should have access to these medications. We are seeing people having to choose between access to their medications and housing and that's not right, especially now that, again, this is the standard of care. And what the amendment does is that it allows substance use disorder medication, but it doesn't allow mental health disorder medications. And most people have co-occurring disorders, meaning they need both in order to get better. And so to deny someone their prescribed medications in order to get better, I don't agree with that at all, because people will not get better without their treatment. Um, having said that, I have been in conversations with Senator Rasmussen about this issue, and I certainly appreciate his work on it. We have come up with compromise language with the Association of Sober Homes and with the providers. Um, this is not what that is. Um, so um, I, it is a friendly amendment uh, with, with good intentions, and if we accept it, it will get changed in conference to the compromise language that we have come up with um, as a stakeholder group. So honestly, we can either accept it or not today because we have come up with a solution um, already. So thank you, Mr. President. Any other discussion on the A27 amendment? Uh, Senator Abler, before we go to the author of the amendment. Right, thank you. And, um, and I hope we can just put it on. It's, it's friendly to the idea. Um, and so maybe if Senator Mann would yield for our question. Senator Mann, will you yield? She will yield. Senator Abler. Well, thank you. Um, so could you just briefly describe the state of negotiations and where you're coming, where, where you're going to land uh, on this, uh, this, this matter? 
uh, just briefly, for the sake of us, I have not been at those meetings, but I know there's a lot of people that are keenly interested in this, uh, specifically some providers and some people who are interested in continuing in their sober homes. So if she wouldn't mind giving a couple minute summary, that would be nice. Members, uh, I'm going to allow it today, but I want us to be mindful because something happened the other day where even some of the authors of amendments were saying that many of our discussions were going a little more far field and wasn't really concentrating on their, their um, amendment and therefore they had to reset the, the conversation. So this is just a gentle re reminder that when there's a, a matter before the body that I just ask that we keep our comments and our discussions to that amendment. If it's on anything else about the bill, you'll have more than enough time by which to do that, but it just helps us stay focused on what's before the body. So the A27 is before us. The question has been asked and Senator uh, Mann says she would yield. So Senator Mann to Senator Abler's question. Thank you, Mr. President. Absolutely, Senator Abler. So um, what we're doing is just having a two-year time period where sober homes can adjust their practices to get ready to include the medications because they also know that this is the standard of care and people need these medications. Um, and so it's a bar bipartisan, bicameral effort. We have um, that amendment being introduced in the House, and that will go in the House version. Thank you. Uh, Senator Rasmussen, I just want to make sure there's no one else that wants to speak before we go to the author of the amendment. Sen Sen uh, Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. President. I appreciate the discussion on this very important topic today. And I, I want to underscore the important work and the role that Minnesota sober homes play in our continuum of care for our neighbors, fellow Minnesotans who are going uh, on their path to recovery. And I, I think this amendment would address some of the concerns that I've heard, especially from the sober homes in my community, uh, many of which don't receive support from the state. And I'm glad to hear the dedication to continuing this conversation and conference committee and appreciate all the stakeholders uh, striking that right balance so that we still have access to sober homes for Minnesotans who need them. Thank you, Mr. President. With that being said, um, on the A27 amendment, all in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails and the A27 amendment is adopted. <laughs> Senator Housley. Thank you, Mr. President. I have the A29 amendment. Senator Housley offers the A29 amendment and the secretary will report the A29 amendment. Senator Housley moves to amend Senate file number 4399 as follows. Page 47, delete section two. This is the A29 amendment. Senator Housley, to your A29 amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. And I just had a brief conversation with Senator Hoffman. Um, and I'm sorry, this, this bill got bumped to the top of the, the list, so I didn't get a chance earlier to discuss this with him. But what this amendment does is it helps the providers of low-income assisted living services to continue providing those services as they are today. Uh, these critical services are struggling across our state and we shouldn't be adding unfunded mandates that make their lives harder than they already are. Um, it, this, as it currently stands, it exempts providers and they will not be able to provide services to these low income families. So, um, Senator Hoffman, it was brought up in committee. The long, this came from the long-term care imperative um, and they did testify about, from, about this section of the bill. Um, and it didn't get taken out of the bill, even though um, they had many testifiers. So I know I've discussed it with you briefly, um, but that's what this amendment would do, and I'm hoping you will take it as a friendly amendment. Senator uh, Hoffman to the A29 Housley Amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. Advice. Um, if this does not, will Senator, will the good Senator from uh, Stillwater uh, yield? Senator Housley, will you yield? She will yield. Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. President. The contextual argument, if this does not change what we want, what we're doing in that section, other than assure that the low income assisted living services are protected, then to me, it, it seems friendly. Could you please help me understand? Senator Housley to Senator Hoffman's question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And yes, Senator Hoffman, my amendments are always friendly. Uh, but this 
as it stands, it requires these assisted livings to adhere to the licensure statutes, um, requiring them to uh, go through additional hoops. So this would, re would allow them to continue offering the services that they already are. Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. President, and I accept it as a friendly amendment. No roll call needed, just uh, vote yes. Any other discussion on the A29 amendment? Any last words, Senator uh, Housley? Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Hoffman. On the A29 amendment, all in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails, and the A29 amendment is adopted. <laughs> Senator Abler. Thank you, Mr. President. I move the A30 amendment. Senator uh, Abler offers the A30 amendment. The secretary will report the A30 amendment. Senator Abler moves to amend Senate file number 4399 as follows. Page 13 after line 20, insert. This is the A30 amendment. Senator Abler to your A30 amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, this body has been a leader in uh, helping individuals who have severe needs, uh, and that which I'll define as someone who needs 10 or more hours of PCA care a day, which means they cannot get out of bed uh, without assistance. Um, some people need, frankly, every, uh, every hour of every day. <laughs> and so we've been able to get some enhanced rates uh, for the, to get, attract individuals to handle these more complex individuals. Uh, and it's uh, been successful. We're able to give them a 7.5% uh, rate above the, the par rate, which has been a really good thing, and that's been done on a collaborative basis. Um, there are some technical things that have to be done uh, along this. Some involve money, one involves policy, but this will assure, this amendment will assure that um, all the monies that are put aside for this purpose actually go to that purpose. It's, it, if you uh, keep track of the Human Services Committee, uh, Mr. Chair, um, this uh, amendment takes three pages to say that, um, but I believe it's friendly with Senator Hoffman, and I would encourage people to vote yes. Senator Hoffman on the A30 amendment. Thank you, Mr. President, and it just looks like it's at an enhanced rate of 107%. It must, the additional revenue attributes to the rate enhancements under this must go toward wages. Is that correct? Uh, if this good senator from Minoka would validate that for me. Senator um, Abler to Senator Hoffman's question. Mr. President, yes. Senator Hoffman. Friendly amendment, Mr. President. Any other discussion on the A30 amendment? Any last words, Senator Abler? Seeing none, on the A30 amendment, all in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails and the A30 amendment is adopted. <laughs> Senator Ress. Uh, Mr. President, I offer the A25 amendment. Senator Ress offers the A25 amendment. The secretary will report the A25 amendment. Senator Ress moves to amend Senate file number 4399 as follows. Page 59, delete section 24. This is the A25 amendment. Senator Ress to your A25 amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. This amendment um, deletes one section from the third article of the um, of this bill and is a rent control measure that is uh, not, not needed and will affect um, dramatically, I believe, um, construction opportunities for 4D housing, which is one of the um, more successful um, programs for uh, low income and in this instance for senior uh, for seniors. Uh, 4D1 classification is a um, property tax classification um, that um, provides that um, at least 20% gets a favorable tax rating um, if at least 20% of the total units in the rental property meet uh, one of the following um, qualifications. That is, um, it's a project-based Section 8. Um, it is uh, receiving uh, low-income housing tax credits. That's one that is referred to in this, um, in this provision, um, 42, 42G, uh, commonly called Section 
42G or just Section 42 with regard to um, the provisions there. Um, the third and fourth are receiving uh, rental assistance through rural uh, housing services of the USDA or fourth rent and income restrictions that are required by state, federal, or local units of government. Um, the provision that, that's, that I am proposing to delete um, further limits annual uh, rent or limits rent increases um, beyond what are the rent limits that are already and the rent third limits that are already in, um, in the 4D 42G uh, um, program. Uh, limiting rent increases for these units are likely to um, reduce the number of available Class 4D1 units that uh, qualify under uh, Section 42G. Uh, developers, property owners may very well be unable to increase rents in these units uh, in an amount necessary to offset uh, costs either to develop additional properties or to maintain the property as a continued Class 4D low-income rental property. The Department of Revenue has uh, indicated that the number of Class 4D1 units that qualify under, 40, uh, under Section 42 um, is greater than 50% of the um, uh, 40 uh, of the 4D rental units that are um, available, according to um, their report for taxes payable in uh, 2021. In addition, the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2018 established income averaging as a third set aside for qualified low income housing projects under Section 42G um, of the Internal Revenue Code. And um, this year, we are clarifying in um, uh, a proposed provision for in the tax bill uh, that we understand that to be the, the case also for the state of, of Minnesota. And it would um, allow uh, and does allow the federal level um, uh, income averaging, allows those units to serve households earning as much as 80% um, of AMI, provided that the average income rent limit in the property is 60% or less of AMI. And um, property owners who elect to use income averaging measures um, must um, commit to having at least 40% of the units and income uh, rent and income restricted. We do not need um, this, uh, this provision and um, it is, um, uh, was opposed in a letter to um, the chairs of both the House and the Senate um, uh, housing um, um, committees. And uh, uh, Mr. President, I request a roll call. Roll call requested. Roll call granted. Uh, Senator Huffman <laughs> to the A25 <laughs> amendment. Mr. President, I, I listened to the conversations from the good Senator from New Hope, and I would wonder if she would yield for a, one simple question. Senator Russ, will you yield for one simple question? We had talked about this typical conversation multiple times. She will yield, Senator Hoffman. Thank you. Sorry, Mr. President. We talked about this multiple times, and I'm wondering if, uh, given our conversations, if she'd be willing to remove the uh, roll call from this vote. Senator Ress, to the question. Mr. President, I would... Um, I would request, my answer is that I would request Senator Hoffman to 
um, express his support for my amendment before I remove the roll call. Senator Hoffman, to the question provided by Senator Ress. Cogitorum there, uh, Mr. President. That's Latin for I understand. Um, the, uh, I wonder if Senator Abler would yield on this. Senator Abler, will you, uh, uh, will you, yes. Uh, Senator Hoffman, Thank you, you Mr. Yield. Thank you, Mr. President. And, and uh, Senator Abler, isn't there some, you know, we heard the, the long explanation from the good senator from New Hope regarding um, 4D and some other provisions, but what we were really talking about within our contextual conversation is about some Section 42 providers that are represented in, I don't know, Senator May Quaid's district, Senator Mitchell's district, I know the district I used to represent, which you represent now, has that same kind of thing. Isn't that the real context of this discussion about how people that are on fixed incomes are being affected by greed? Senator Abler, to the question. Well, thank you for asking the question. You know, Mr. President, um, did we spend a billion dollars last time on housing? I think so. Um, and so what are we going to get for that? Uh, the Fed spend, is a bazillion a number, um, a lot of money on federal tax credits in this program, in the Section 42, but also in the 4D program, which is not part of this amendment, um, in the name of affordable housing. And we, this is a, there's one in Coon Rapids um, that is, uh, and, the, and they're around, there's maybe a dozen or so places affected by this, I would guess, something like that. Um, and so the, they're income limited to come in because it's meant to be for modest income people. I think the limit is in the 40s. A lot of these residents, Mr. President, actually make in the 20s a year because they're on Social Security. And they were so excited. Some people, in fact, have um, sold their homes to move into this affordable, lovely place. Uh, and uh, they may have had payments on their home. Uh, and as time has gone on, only to find out that the rent on this place, these places are more than their payment used to be, um, and in a much more constrained environment, and they have remorse. And, there's, um, and so under this program, the rent may be raised by something called the AMI, which is the Area Median Income. And ordinarily, that's a pretty modest increase, but then inflation happened, and the AMI became 12.4%. Now, Mr. President, there are some nonprofit versions of these Section 42 places, and they raised their rent by maybe 1% because they actually had, well, frankly, ethics. And they understood the population they were serving, and the heat went up a little bit, the taxes went up a little bit, so they raised them based upon that. Uh, this particular company, and I don't know if I'm supposed to single one out, but it starts with a D and rhymes with Miam, um, uh, Imium. Um, uh, did uh, raise them the maximum. Mr. President, do you know why they raised them the maximum? Well, thank you for being interested in that answer. Uh, because they could. And, and so because they could. And each and every year, in every place, except for the one in my district, because we, they agreed to keep it down to 3%, um, they raised everybody else's the max. And if you look at their books, um, God bless profit-taking, and people making a good living on their investments, but the, but the returns have been unrealistic based upon the population and the implication that they would indeed consider the needs of their residents when they made their increases. And not only that, they've um, maximized, in many cases, they've maximized other expenses, um, utilities, uh, charging for parking that's supposed to be without a fee, um, and even barely, the, barely plowing the parking lots. And so, uh, Senator Hoffman, to your question, this involves not any new rent control, this involves a new index to control the pricing on these places. And I would dare say, Mr. President, that the nonprofit entities in this world will see no difference in their behaviors. But Mr. President, this will constrain the inordinate uh, wrong behavior of some companies who are deciding to maximize revenues on some of these individuals. And I'll just give one brief example and then I'll uh, yield the floor back to Senator Hoffman. Um, 
there's a, we heard, we, they've had meetings about this, and one woman stood up in particular, and when she moved in, she makes 2000 a month, more or less, and when she moved in five years ago, it was 1050 and she figured, well, I can afford paying half my money uh, for rent. Her current rent is $1,700, and she has like $300 with which to pay for food, and Quite, and, and other expenses that they have, and 300 bucks isn't a lot, Mr. President, um, about $10 a day. Uh, and so the question she asks is, what am I supposed to do? And so bringing this forward, Mr. President, um, is, a, is, is a, a num number of us agree that we have to find some way to constrain this bad behavior, and this is the effort here. So Senator Hoffman, that's why it's in the bill. Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. President. I just want to confirm that I still have the floor. Is that correct, Mr. President? That is correct, Senator Thank you. Hoffman, which is why I, I, um, why I yielded to you. Senator I, I, Hoffman. I love that, Mr. President, and I, I appreciate the good Senator from Anoka, because that really is the, the, the whole essence of this conversation. And given the fact that you know there are some provisions in there that might dip over to taxes. I mean, we've tried this seven, eight, nine times, uh, Senator Abler, and, and maybe we'll you know, finally get it right to protect the people that are there. But before I go to that, answering the question that Senator uh, from New Hope asked, I wonder if Senator Mitchell will uh, yield. Senator Mitchell, will you yield for a question? She will yield. Senator Hoffman. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. And, and Senator Mitchell, I, your background as a, as, an, as, a, as a mom, your background as a lawyer, your background working with the general public, it, it, what Senator Abler is saying, does that resonate to any concerns that you might have within your certain district? Senator Mitchell, to the question proposed by Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Senator Hoffman. Yes, I, I think many of us in general on a bipartisan level have been working on um, how short we are in housing in Minnesota, and then it impacts various communities in various ways, from uh, actual working families becoming unhoused because of prices, to our seniors becoming unhoused for the same reason. And I did have a similar situation, um, especially with a, a company in my community, where even when I was door knocking, they tried to keep me out from talking to the residents because what the residents had to tell me is that they were all on fixed income and besides, <clears throat> despite being in an allegedly affordable housing unit, rents were going up 12%. Some of them were having to move in together, which isn't what they wanted to do in their senior years. Some of them in their 70s were having to go get jobs despite their pensions and other things because rent was just becoming too high and some became uh, unhoused, homeless. And so whether we're able to cap the affordable housing rent increases or anything else we can do to help our communities, um, we're really in a dire situation and un unfortunately some entities are, are even making that actively worse. So I appreciate the work that's been done on this um, and that's been done on, on making more housing for people in so many ways. Thank you, Senator Hoffman. Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Senator Mitchell. I, I appreciate that. Um, Mr. President, I, I, I do like this conversation and, and I'm wondering if uh, I can get the good Senator from New Hope to yield to a question. Senator Ress, will you yield? She will yield. Senator Hoffman. Senator Ress, you forget more in a day than many of us will know when it comes to anything to do with taxes, anything that does with this. We've tried from our committee, when it was both chaired and led by Senator Abler and now by me, this conversation is still in front of us because of the concern we have for people that are vulnerable, adults. We have the highest amount of elderly in Minnesota, even greater than K-12 education, right? It's the first time in history. And the other thing, Mr. President, the Wilder Foundation, their latest homeless report, the, high, the number one growing folks of homeless are people 62 and older. And so if, if the good senator from New Hope would be willing to help me understand and help our committee understand how it is we can start to hold from folks at bay and at task for the things they should be delivering to our elderly. Is that, can I get that commitment? Because if I can, um, then I'll accept her amendment and we'll move forward and, and hopefully she'll withdraw the roll call. Senator Rest, to the question. <clears throat> Mr. President and members, Senator Hoffman, I would just suggest that you consider um, this 
uh, extreme rent control measure in light of um, the whole universe of 4D properties and low-income properties and acknowledge that it is um, an, an unreasonable reaction uh, to the uh, situation that um, Senator, um, Senator Abler mentioned um, regarding one of his constituents um, and that that has um, that particular situation has become um, an anomaly, and I'm still waiting to um, understand whether you are going to support the amendment. Senator Hoffman, to the A25 amendment. Uh, Mr. President, I'll go ahead and accept it. I, I, I accept her uh, c uh, conversation about the strategy and what we need to do. We're going to keep doing this and as long as we're here. Um, I accept. Uh, I accept her uh, her amendment uh, as it is, and we'll go from there, Senator. Senator Rest. Mr. President, I withdraw the roll call. Roll call has been withdrawn. Any other discussions on the A25? Senator Draskowski. Thank you, Mr. President. I request a roll call on the amendment. Roll call has been requested. Roll call granted. Senator Abler, are you standing to be recognized? Senator Abler. Mr. President, I've known you for a long time. I'm happy you recognize me. That's good. Um, so, um, Mr. President, when a program that's meant to do right does wrong, and it's a federal program, and the state's in a position to do something to make it better, what is my responsibility, Mr. President, and what is our responsibility as legislators? When the people you're intending to help get harmed, is it okay to stand idly by and watch them come to harm, particularly people in their golden years, where they've relied on uh, implications that, that the rent will be nominally increased? Um, Mr. President, this is not extreme rent control. This is limiting abuse in an already controlled program. And I, and so I don't think this will affect one housing, one unit being developed. I don't think this will affect any company going out of business. It may affect a couple companies' profitability, um, which I have some sadness about, but if the profitability is based upon uh, taking money from people who don't have it, then I'm really troubled by that. And so is this the perfect answer to this problem? Mr. President, it is not. Does this even solve the problem? It solves it for a few people. It doesn't handle the people that are the market rate individuals in these places they came in thinking that they would be in a place with normal rent increases. Um, but Mr. President, what this could be would be a placeholder for a discussion. And that discussion could well be had in the committee that is charged with the welfare of seniors and people who are um, going to be um, otherwise maybe homeless, which is the purview of the Senate, and we kind of share that responsibility, but there's, there's homeless uh, overlap uh, on both the Health Committee and the Human Services Committee. So I could talk a long time about individual cases, Mr. President, but I'm not going to do that. But I'm going to ask members here if they, uh, you know, roll call, no roll call. I was not part of that discussion. But I brought this amendment forward, and in the committee there was there was agreement that something has to be done. And there are people watching at home who live in these places, and there's a couple thousand of them at least, and they don't know what they're going to do. They don't know how they're going to pay gas for their car. They don't know how they're going to pay their utility bill. They don't know if they can even buy a present for their granddaughter uh, for their birthday. 
because they don't have the money because it was wrongly taken by a company that put profits ahead of these, these vulnerable adults. And Mr. President, vulnerable adults is the business of this body and this legislature and this government, and they count on us. We have done so many things to look after vulnerable people. We have protections for assisted living in this bill. We have protections for people with substance abuse. We have protections for seniors in long-term care facilities. Mr. President, if there's a way we can find some way to do this, could we please just carry this forward? And Senator Rest, would you consider just withdrawing your amendment? And it's going to go and it's going to be treated respectfully in the process, and it can be discussed where finally something's off the floor where there's a chance to help these people. And Senator Rest, I promise you, as much as I can promise anything, um, that this project will be different when it finally gets resolved than what it is today. But otherwise, this may never go forward, Mr. President. I don't think we want to have it be the position of the Senate that we say sorry to you. Sorry do you live in St. Anthony and Woodbury and Anoka and Coon Rapids about this stuff. And I'm not trying to even draw another senator into this. I'm just telling you, sorry. Sorry. Because we think that a company that's gone awry, taking advantage of $20 million in federal tax credits to build a $30 million project, should be allowed to make even more money at the, at the hands of the people that I care so much about, that I have sworn to look after. We've had meeting after meeting, Mr. President. So, Mr. President, either Senator Russ, could you withdraw it, or members, please decide to vote yes. Not for the, each detail of the nuance, but just say, we care about this, and we're going to be amongst the answers to resolving your peril that you're in. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, we are on the A25 amendment. I'm going to Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. President. And to Senator Abler and to Senator Hoffman, I very much appreciate this conversation, and I appreciate the efforts and the visibility that you're bringing to this issue. There are those seniors across the state that are on fixed incomes and many other def demographics that are challenged right now with their housing costs. But the reality is housing costs are increasing because the underlying costs of home ownership and of rental properties is also increasing. Insurance is increasing at double-digit rates year over year. Property taxes are increasing significantly. The cost of maintenance, labor, the cost of supplies to replace anything that might be needed continues to skyrocket. Those costs need to get passed on. And so, Mr. President, I'm in favor of the rest amendment. But I appreciate what Senator Abler and Senator Hoffman are doing, and I want to be part of those conversations. But extreme rent control is not a solution. As costs continue to increase, and if government puts a limit on the costs that can be passed on to tenants, that will result in one of two things. Either the less construction or reduced construction of those desperately needed units and or the closing down or pulling off units that are presently on the market because the cost will exceed the amount of revenue that can be collected. Again, my heart goes out to those that are experiencing the pain of the high cost of housing. But extreme rent control is not a solution, and we can't be in a position in this body or in government as a whole to simply do something. Because the do something mentality, such as the provision that's in the bill, will make it worse and increase the hardship. It is not a solution. So, Mr. President, I look forward to those conversations so we can help our seniors, those on fixed income, and any other demographic. But we need to have those conversations not in the threat of a rent control. So please support the rest of the amendment. Thank you. Members, we're on the A25 amendment. I'm going to Senator Jaskowski. Thank you, Mr. President. I withdraw my request for roll call. Roll call withdrawn. S Senator Kunish, I saw someone pointing towards you. Senator Kunish.
Thank you. I, um, I have quite a few of these Dominion communities in my, in my, uh, in my uh, district, thank you, <laughs> in my district. And I am oh, constantly getting complaints from the people that live there. Not only do they come in at a certain rate and those rents are jacked up within a few weeks, but it continues throughout the entire year. They also charge additional fees. So in one of the communities that I live in, somebody showed me a bill where they pre-charge for uh, utilities. They, they think what the person is going to spend in advance and then put that on their bill for the month and have no idea because none of them are metered. And so when we look at how these people come into a situation where they think that they can afford to live in a decent place, in a community that is safe uh, with others of their own age and interests, only to find out that within a few short Within a year, they are absolutely priced out. And they are nickeled and dimed for every little thing. Every little thing. It's the least that we can do to help them with some of these controls to ensure that uh, they have this safe place to live for a long time and uh, the, that organizations, companies, Corporations like Dominion can't take advantage of them and uh, act in such predatory ways. Members, any other discussion on the A25 amendment? That is what is before us. Senator McQuaid. Thank you, Mr. President. And, and I just, I, a few of my colleagues have talked about the harm that is coming to seniors in their community. And I'm also a member who has seniors in their community who have seen their rent go up astronomically at a place they live that is overwhelmingly subsidized by the federal government and our local government. And so, you know, the broader conversation about rent control, the broader conversation about that being a thing, this is really specific, and it's really, really something that folks need. And so I, I really appreciate this being included in the bill, and I think Senator Abler, the great senator from Anoka, and the other great senator from Anoka uh, for um, putting this in the bill, because it is really important. Thank you. Any other discussion on the A25 amendment before we go to the author, if she wants to have any last words? Seeing none, Senator Rest, you want to make any final comments? She says no. Uh, on the A25 amendment, all in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. no. The motion prevails that A25 is adopted. Any other members want to put forth an amendment to the uh, to Senate file 4399? Seeing none, the secretary will give the bill its third reading. Senate file number 4399, a bill for an act relating to human services, modifying and establishing laws regarding disability services. Third reading. Any other discussions before we go to the author of the bill? Uh, Senator Abler. Well, thank you, Mr. Uh, President and members, and I appreciate that discussion. And I know that that vote does not indicate the concern the Senate has about abuse of federal and state programs and helping seniors find themselves homeless in the face of a, of a place they thought would be their, their, their uh, final home. Um, but so uh, to the bill, and I again want to thank Senator Hoffman for his uh, collegial approach. I think that was evidenced in the amendments that were accepted today. Um, the, uh, the, there's just the, still two areas that are yet to be resolved all the way, and that's the 144G part with the assisted living, uh, which is uh, going to be a, a topic in conference, I'm sure, and then the sober housing. And I appreciate Senator Mann's approach to that and working with people. Um, there's a lot of good stuff in this bill, Mr. President, and uh, I don't need to elaborate on that. But this is a this is a, a policy bill, and there's except for one really great provision that's no longer in the bill. Um, it's still a good bill, even not quite as good as it was, Mr. President. But um, this bill will do a lot of good for people with substance abuse, people living in long-term care. Uh, people living in, in nursing homes and, in, and, um, 
in, in group homes. And I think it's, um, I would encourage members that they could vote yes on this bill with some confidence that it's actually sound and it's going to come back uh, uh, even with a few more bugs worked out of it. So thank you, Mr. President. We're on final passage of Senate file 4399. Any other uh, discussions before I go to the author of the bill for final comments? Seeing none, Senator Hoffman for brief comments. Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. Mr. President, I want to thank uh, Omar Fateh, Senator Jim Abler, Senator Elise Mann, Senator Matthews, Senator Mayquade, Senator Mitchell, Senator Etke, Senator Rasmussen, Senator Wickland, along with uh, our committee administrator, David Zack, our legislative assistant chair, uh, Cassie Soar, and then, of course, you cannot get this stuff done in the state of Minnesota without the work of Leon Monahan and Kyle Raymond, who are the the analysts, both the fiscal analysts and the, and the policy folks that are nonpartisan. They are absolutely a treasure to the state of Minnesota. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Harpstead, for your staff, allowing them to help us get some technical changes that need Christy Grom, Matthew Burdick, uh, Nicole, and um, Elise Bailey. So with that, uh, it's a good bill, Mr. President. Vote green. Members, we are now on final passage of Senate File 4399. As amended, the secretary will take the roll. Members, please vote. Senator Kunis, for those voting pursuant to Rule 40.7. Mr. President, Senator Dietzik votes aye. Senator Dietzik votes aye. And Senator Port votes aye. And Senator Port votes aye. Senator Jasinski, for those voting pursuant to Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Duckworth votes aye. Senator Duckworth votes aye. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Miller votes aye. And Senator Miller votes aye. All senators having voted who desires to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There have been 58 ayes and nine noes. The bill is passed and its title agreed to. <laughs> Members, pursuant to our special orders uh, list, we will now go to Senate File 4225. Senator Putnam for the Omnibus Agricultural Policy Bill. Senator Putnam. Thank you very much, Mr. President and members. The bill we have before you right now is the Omnibus Agriculture Policy Bill. It is a result of tremendous bipartisan work. No, no, let's go past bipartisan. We went past bipartisan into postpartisan, and we worked on problems, and we solved them, and we came together with this fantastic bill. The overwhelming majority of the bill is, uh, consists of recommendations from the Department of Agriculture. It's their opportunity, our opportunity to help them do their job a little bit better. So that's the bulk of this bill. There are a couple other things that aren't a function of that. I'm going to talk through a couple of them really quickly just to give you an idea of what is actually in this bill. Um, the first of which is we've done some stuff to help smaller uh, folks involved in agriculture. One, we've got Senator uh, Kupek's bill uh, that uh, has some revisions to our groundbreaking uh, grain indemnity fund that we did uh, last year that will uh, make things a little bit easier on smaller grain producers. Then we also uh, created a portal for the Department of Agriculture to track complaints about potential uh, violations of corporate agriculture farm law uh, in uh, the state of Minnesota, which is also pretty good. And a couple other things from our friends in the minority. I don't know if any of you guys know this, uh, but there's a zoo in Senator Westrom's district. Uh, he's very shy. He doesn't mention it very frequently. Uh, but there is a zoo in Senator Westrom's district, and that zoo is really interested in getting a reindeer. Uh, so we have uh, facilitated the transfer of that reindeer, uh, when I think we should all have a field trip and go check it out someday. 
Uh, one of the other things we did is uh, a bill by our friend Senator Liskey uh, about uh, estray uh, animals. Um, members, uh, this was a very compelling and powerful moment uh, in the session for us this year in the Agriculture Committee because a man was there whose dog went stray and his neighbor kept it, which is extremely uncool. So what we did, uh, with the help of Senator Liskey, is create a situation wherein people are required to report stray animals before they just keep them. I'm pretty happy about that. That's a very general, high-level overview of the policy, view of the policy bill. It's very brief, but I will say this. It's balanced, it's bipartisan, it's thoughtful, it's uh, productive, uh, and if you don't vote for it, you clearly hate puppies. Any other discussion on Senate File 4225? Senator Liskey. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I am uh, happy to just say that uh, I'm very thankful to Senator Putnam for this bill. Uh, I look forward to voting for it. Uh, with the farmer's market and the uh, changes there, it's going to help a lot of people with small businesses. They're very small businesses. They're working on getting their products uh, taste tested, uh, and this will help improve the ability for those uh, individuals to get their products out there. Uh, and again, uh, thank you to Senator Wiesenberg, Senator Kupek, and Senator Hoffman for helping me get the bill across the, across the line for the omnibus bill for the stray animals. Uh, there's about 10 million stray animals that go missing in the U.S. every year, and about 35% of those animals don't make it home. So uh, the bill was very important for the fact that this will help people find those missing animals, and, and hopefully we will resolve some of those families that are distraught about those animals. Um, so, Senator Putnam, again, thank you very much for this wonderful bill, and uh, I look forward to hearing more discussion. Thank you. Senator Westrom. Mr. President, I'd offer the A13 amendment. Senator Westrom offers the A13 amendment. The Secretary will report the A13 amendment. Senator Westrom moves to amend Senate file number 4225 as follows. Page 8, after line 29, insert. This is the A13 amendment. Senator Westrom, to your A13 amendment. Mr. President, um, members, Senator uh, Putnam uh, did a nice job overviewing uh, the bill, the ag policy bill. Uh, there's a lot of good provisions, uh, provisions that are just necessary and changing uh, what we do at government. but. This year is the off year, the non-budget year, so it's not as big as the normal ag bill. Uh, but there's one provision we'd like to uh, improve on this for consumers. And so the A13 amendment, I would urge you to support. It's a pared down version of the original bill I had introduced this year. The ag committee had heard it, passed it out. Uh, but members, uh, well, actually heard it and laid it over, as I recall. What this would do is just set up labeling for foods for consumers. I've had consumers talk to me about different foods. or cell-cultured meat, uh, where the meat is made in a lab. It's not chicken. It's not salmon. It's not beef. And that is a growing industry. Some are interested in it. That's fine. Uh, consumers want to know what that food is or what's in their meat if they're buying it in the grocery store or buying something and not knowing what's in it. And we don't want people to not know what's in their food. There's another part that might bug you like it bugs consumers, and it even bugs me if there were foods that had bugs mixed into them intentionally, and we weren't told about that either. And so members, this A13 amendment just is a uh, labeling requirement for foods. It doesn't require separate preparation tables uh, like uh, I had originally in my bill, but this just sets forth that if there's uh, bugs in your food for protein, cricket flour, whatever it is, it needs to be labeled. The consumers need to know. If your meat is cell cultured and grown in a Petri dish, you also need to know. Uh, consumers should have that knowledge as they shop in the stores or buy their food. They should know what the real source of it is or what the ingredients is. And so this is 
should be a common sense, easy way to go. Let's uh, let the consumers be aware if there's bugs or if their meat is cell cultured, and then they can decide. I'd urge your support. Mr. President, I'd ask for a roll call. Roll call requested, roll call granted. Senator Putnam to the A13 amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Westrom, for offering this amendment. Um, I will say that we had a very fascinating conversation about this issue in committee. Uh, it was edifying. It was interesting. Uh, one thing that came from that discussion is that currently there is only one space in the entire country that is selling cell-cultivated meat, uh, and that was a restaurant in San Francisco that has already stopped doing it. This is, in a sense, a future problem. This particular bill, we're not entirely sure of its expense, if it would cost money for MDA to, to put in a program like this. So while I agree that that consumers should know what they are consuming. This is not the way to do it. And so members, I uh, urge a uh, no vote on this amendment, please. We are on the A13 amendment. We're going to Senator Wiesenberg. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I don't know if anyone talked about allergies or allergens or uh, what might be in these products and what could hurt people. I have a condition called idiopathic anaphylaxis. I actually have my EpiPen setting my desk right now. So if any of this stuff happens to show up in food and I don't know about it, I could die. So it's imperative that these labels be on foods because it's not just me. There's many people that could have allergies to this. So if we're having bug parts, which I actually anaphylaxed the dead mayflies, which sounds crazy, but it's true, um, we need to know about it. So if there's bugs in my food, I need to know about it. If it might, it's not a future thing, it's happening. And this bill would say that we have to have that printed on the label. And this is going to affect people's health and people could actually die. And then there's going to be lawsuits. So we need to accept this amendment because it, ju it just makes sense. So I, I would support his amendment and we should all be voting yes. Thank you. Members, remember we're on the A13 amendment, which is the Western Amendment. We're going to Senator Abler. Well, thank you, Mr. President. And we've uh, worked on a lot of laws together over time. And there's some laws that... 10 years ago would have been so easy to pass because like there are people are like what and then something comes up uh, In real time and there's people that are dug in they're selling something or they have stock in a company or whatever And it's really hard to pass what should have been such common sense before when I I'm just kind of surprised that the author of this bill says well Let's not do this today because it's not a thing um, Mr. President Everything is becoming a thing. Um, there is, you know, the <laughs> there, there is engineered products everywhere. It, it, currently, <clears throat> there's a requirement that bioengineered products have to be disclosed in the label that it contains one or more bioengineered things. Old Dutch potato chips contains bioengineered products. So if you don't care, well, then you can go buy them. If you buy uh, Clancy's chips has bioengineered. Um, I think Santia does not. And so if that's important, you can choose. So I, I don't even, I'm not going to talk long about it, but this to me is, is as much of a no-brainer of any amendment we ever could ask. Figure it out, but please tell people what they're getting. Um, we, uh, and uh, I have a restaurant, we're, we're required to disclose that undercooked meat um, might cause you to be ill. Like, people don't know that. I'm required to put that on my menu, a little asterisk by our steaks, that if you get undercooked steaks, you actually could enjoy a good steak, but, you, uh, but, that, but, it's, but it's, it's, that, my, that mine is over-labeling, but we do that because we want to protect people who might not know. So I hope this isn't some kind of partisan vote on this thing. I mean, there's a time for partisan votes. We have philosophies about stuff, but Senator Putnam, I wish you would just say, uh, this is fine with me, and let's just have the Senate realize, Senate agree that let's tell people what's in their food that may, some people don't even consider to be food. Thank you. Any other discussion on the A13 amendment before we go to the author of the amendment? Any other discussion on the A13? Seeing none, we're going to the author as the last voice you'll hear before we take the roll. Senator Westrom. Well, Mr. President, members, it ought to bug you if there were bugs in your food and you didn't know it. It ought to concern you if your meat was cell cultured in a petri dish and you thought it was raised in a pasture. 
That's all this amendment does. Let's you know if there's bugs in your food or if your meat is cell cultured and not from the farm. I urge your support. Members, the secretary will take the roll on the A13 amendment. Please vote. Senator Kunis, for those voting pursuant to Rule 40.7. Um, Mr. President, Senator Dietzik votes no. Senator Dietzik votes no. And Senator Port votes no. Senator Port votes no. Senator Jasinski, for those voting pursuant to Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Duckworth votes aye. Senator Duckworth votes aye. Senator Miller votes aye. And Senator Miller votes aye. All senators having voted who desires to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There have been 33 ayes and 34 noes. Senate file, four, excuse me, um, the A13 amendment is not adopted. Senator Dreheim. Thank you, Mr. President, um, and thank you, members, for the discussion. Um, I, I would like to offer the A14 amendment, Mr. Senator President. Senator Dreheim offers the A14 amendment. The secretary will report the A14 amendment. Senator Dreheim moves to amend Senate file number 4225 as follows, page 8 after line 29, insert. This is the A14 amendment. Senator Dreheim to your A14 amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. And uh, I, I'd like to thank the author uh, of this bill. I, I think overall the bill is uh, a very good bill. This is kind of building on what Senator Westrom um, just tried to put onto the bill about lab-grown meat or cell-grown meat. And my take was a little different. Um, I did not include bugs. Not that I don't think bugs need to be defined and labeled. Um, but my main concern was the lab-grown meat or the cell-grown meat. And as, as we know, as we dig into different topics, you find out things, and, and the most interesting thing I found out about this um, lab-grown meat industry, that the federal government has been working on figuring out how to label it since 2018. 2018. We're in 2024, members. I heard in testimony from three different companies that are producing lab-grown meat. So I, I think it's gonna be here sooner than some think. And, and I'm sure the reason it's not uh, catching on is the cost of growing meat in a lab or a warehouse. And why I think it's important to get in front of it is for transparency. I wanna know what I'm feeding my family. I want to know where my food's coming from. Right now, this is a gray area. So the A14 helps clear that up, Mr. President, and I urge everybody to vote green. Members, we're on the A14 amendment. Uh, Senator Putnam to the A14 amendment. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Dreheim, for uh, um, uh, bringing this amendment to us again. I agree, as I said earlier, that I do think uh, consumer awareness of what's in their food is incredibly important. Uh, and this bill, as did Senator Westham's prior bill, takes some steps in those di uh, direction in a good way. Um, but I will say, and I'll say again what I said in my uh, earlier response, which unfortunately was not acknowledged as much, is that procedurally, some of these things are going to take some money, and there's no money in this bill. So for that reason, uh, among the other ones that I mentioned earlier, uh, I urge a no vote on this bill. Any other discussion on the A14 amendment before we go back to the author of the amendment? And, uh, Mr. President, I'm sorry, but I ask for roll call as well, if it could please. Roll call requested, roll call granted. Any other discussion before we go back to the author of the A14 amendment? Senator Abler. Well, Mr. President, I just, it's amazing how history reverses itself sometimes. As I've watched the history of federal labeling, it's customarily been the, the left side of the aisle that's like, oh, we gotta tell people what's in there, a lot of the carcinogens and the additives and what's in there. And the, it's been the other on the right, like, oh, well, no, it's gonna be a big imposition on business and you know, the farms are gonna go out of quit working now and, and all that. And, and today it's the opposite. The only reason I say this is I was shocked by the last vote. And I don't believe, I mean, people vote how they vote, but I don't believe that the people that voted no on that last one would like people to be unaware of what is in their food. So I uh, just want to remind people about the history of this topic and Senator Putnam, I would really hope that you could be a leader on this and you get to be whatever leader you want to be on the topic. And just because there's no money in the bill doesn't mean we can't establish a policy. And so it'd be the policy of the state of Minnesota that at least if there's meat that you're buying, it's really gonna be meat. Thanks. Members, before we go to the author of the A14 Amendment, any other discussions? Seeing none, Senator Dreheim for the final comments, and then we will vote on the A14 Amendment. Thank you, Mr. President, um, and I, thank you, Senator Putnam. Um, I, I do understand there is a fiscal note on this uh, original bill that the A14 was drafted on. So with that, I will withdraw it and offer the A15. The A14 amendment has been withdrawn. Senator Dreheim offers the A15 amendment, and the secretary will report the A15 amendment. Senator Dreheim moves to amend Senate file number 4225 as follows. Page 15 after line 12, insert. This is the A15 amendment. Senator Dreheim to your A15 amendment. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, uh, Senator Putnam and, and members for the discussion. Um, I can count. My uh, previous amendment was a, very similar to Senator Westrom's amendment. Um, so I, I have a compromise, and I hope everybody can get behind the compromise, and that's the A15. It simply states that we're asking the commissioner to come up with some options, and next year, come back with a list of options that we can vote on so we can be a leader in, in this field and uh, label cell-grown meat, lab-grown meat, any type of food product. Uh, pretty simple. I hope the author supports the A15. Senator Putnam to the A15 amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Dreheim. Uh, I consider this a friendly amendment from a friendly senator. Uh, the issue here, as I've said all along, my response to the other things is everybody wants to have consumer awareness of the food that, they're eat, uh, that they eat, uh, but some of us want to do that in a thoughtful way. And so this is the opportunity to think about it as we do it and to do it right. So I support this amendment and urge a green vote. Any other discussion on the A15 amendment? Seeing none, Senator Dreheim, do you have any final words or is it okay to go forward? He said it's okay to go forward. All in favor of the A15 amendment say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. The A15 amendment is adopted. <laughs> Members, we are still on Senate file 4225 as amended. Wiesenberg, Senator Wiesenberg. Thank you, Mr. President. I have the A50 amendment. Senator, Wiesen Senator Wiesenberg offers the A50 amendment, and the Secretary will report the A50 amendment. Senator Wiesenberg moves to amend Senate file number 4225 as follows. Page 4, delete section 5. This is the A50 amendment. 
Senator Wiesenberg to your A50 amendment. So I'm reading here on uh, talking about damage caused by elk. It starts on page two and goes through page four. Um, so on page four, it talks about compensation and what my amendment would do would just leave it as the language as, as is and not change it. Uh, so my fear is that where it says estimate value, uh, farmers are gonna lose money. So we don't have the money to pay for the damage that the elk is causing, so we're just gonna estimate what they should be getting and give that to them. I think we should leave it alone. In uh, uh, environmental committee, we also took a language that was helpful to farmers, even though the DNR said that the language being removed, they would still do it, they removed the language. Well, if they're not gonna, if they're not gonna work on harming farmers, why did they remove the language? Let's just leave it in there. So this would, let the farmers still get compensated for what their grain's worth, not an estimated value, and that's what we should be doing. We should be working with them and not trying to, I know we're not trying to harm them, but I don't see, I see this as harming, harming farmers, and they've got it hard enough already. They work 365, seven days a week. Thank you. Members, remember we're on the A50 amendment. Any other discussion on the A50 amendment? Senator Putnam. Thank you, Mr. President. I just would like to briefly respond to it and perhaps provide some context. The language that we're discussing right here is language that has been in practice for quite some time uh, under rules authority at the Department of Agriculture. We're simply moving it from rules to statute. Uh, and so for that reason, I oppose this amendment. Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. President, and I do uh, rise in favor of this amendment. Uh, we've been dealing with the uh, elk herds in northern Minnesota for some time. They cause a tremendous amount of damage. The uh, depredation that they cause, there's not enough money for that. We are actually robbing from other accounts to try to make up for that. And the language in this bill, as I see it, with the stricken language and then the new language that's added, certainly appears that it is... Uh, going to reduce the amount that can be paid out to the to farmers. And in the other bills that we've got coming forward, uh, even though they're not part of this bill, they are, uh, they are making it optional now to increase the herds as, it, as they are up there right now, which also will be devastating. And so I think it is important to leave this language as it is. And if, there's, and if the uh, agencies are not following this, then we don't change the language. We make sure that the agencies follow their own law. Thank you. Senator Klein. Mr. President, I request a roll call. Roll call request a roll call granted. Any other discussion on the A50 amendment before I go back to the author? Seeing none, the last words will be Senator Wiesenberg. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, when, when Senator Green spoke there, it did, you know, it, it triggered what he already said, but we're going to be increasing our elk herd and decreasing what farmers are going to be getting reimbursed. And that's not, that's not okay. So there's gonna be more elk and they're gonna be in more farm fields and they're gonna be destroying fence and they're gonna be getting less money for the, dep the, the, the not depredation, they're not, well, I guess they're eating corn, but they're not eating their animals. Anyway, we need to support this amendment. We need to support farmers. Thank you. Senators, we're on the A50 amendment. The secretary will take the roll on the A50 Wiesenberg amendment. Members, please vote. Senator Kunis, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Uh, Mr. President, Senator Dietzik votes no. Senator Dietzik votes no. And Senator Port votes no. And Senator Port votes no. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Duckworth votes aye. Senator Duckworth votes aye. And thank you, Mr. President. Senator Miller votes aye. And Senator Miller votes aye.
All senators having voted who desires to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 32 ayes and 34 noes, the 850 amendment is not adopted. Any other discussions? Seeing none, the secretary will give the bill its third reading. Senate file number 4225, a bill for an act relating to agriculture, amending agriculture policy provisions. Third reading. Any other discussions on, the, on Senate file 4225 as amended? Final brief comments from Senator Putnam. Thank you, Mr. President, members, for the thoughtful conversation. Uh, it's a good bill. You should vote for it. Remember the puppies. The, the secretary will take the roll on final passage of Senate file 4225 as amended. Members, please vote. Senator Kunis, for those voting pursuant to Rule 40.7. Mr. President, Senator Dietzik votes aye. Senator Dietzik votes aye. And Senator Port votes aye. Senator Port votes aye. Senator Jasinski, for those voting pursuant to Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Duckworth votes aye. Senator Duckworth votes aye. And thank you, Mr. President. Senator Miller votes aye. And Senator Miller votes aye. All senators voting who desires to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There have been 58 ayes and nine noes. The bill is passed and its title agreed to. <laughs> Members, we will now go to Senate file number 4097. Senator Klein for the Omnibus Commerce Policy Bill. Senator Klein. Uh, thank you, members, and Mr. President, for hearing the uh, Commerce and Consumer Protection Omnibus Policy Bill this year, Senate File 4097. We had a heavy emphasis this year on consumer protection and had bipartisan authorship of several provisions. I'll only detail a few of them. Uh, much of the bill is department technical language, but we have some very good policies to help Minnesotans. Uh, there is a provision in here that uh, vaping supplies cannot mimic or look like school supplies. Believe it or not, that's a product that's out there. Uh, we have an excellent provision on protections for student uh, loan uh, issuers, uh, excuse me, for student loan uh, purchasers and uh, regulations around that. We have a bipartisan bill on unsubscribe. I think everybody has a story of joining a gym and then it became quite difficult to get yourself out of that gym membership or having an online subscription that then was difficult to unsubscribe from. This bill simply says that if you got in online with a single click or a couple clicks, it should be just that easy to get out of the membership. We have the ticket transparency bill, uh, also called the Taylor Swift bill within here, uh, which says that the price you see at the start of a, a ticket purchase online will be the price that you ultimately pay at the end of that transaction. It also bans speculative sales of tickets. Uh, we heard powerful testimony about the dangers of huffing uh, aerosolized dusters uh, in our committee, uh, and uh, Senator Mann authored a bill that will create warning labels on those products, put them behind the counter, and limit the volume of sales on those products. Uh, we have a uh, provision in here which will remove chemicals from uh, tents uh, and sleeping bags so that kids aren't exposed to those chemicals, which are no longer necessary. Uh, and we have uh, some 
good language to protect first-time users of uh, virtual currency uh, so that grandma doesn't get scammed uh, when she is told that her granddaughter needs cash urgently in California. She'll have some protections uh, to get that money back if, if she is so swindled. Uh, there are a number of other good pr uh, provisions in the bill, members, but those are the ones that we should be most proud of as a Senate. Uh, and Mr. President, I know there are amendments. I will start it off with the A32. Senator Klein offers the A32 amendment. The secretary will report the A32 amendment. Senator Klein moves to amend Senate file number 4097 as follows. Page 16, delete section 6. This is the A32 amendment. Senator Klein, to your A32 amendment. Uh, Mr. Uh, President, this is a, a purely cleanup type amendment. Um, the first part of it deletes language that never should have been in there in the first place. It was put in by mistake. It belongs in the Human Services Bill, uh, and that is uh, uh, page 16 of the bill. Uh, and so that's what that part does. Uh, and then the second part removes the fiscal implications of the student loan provisions uh, so that those will carry separately in a, in a finance bill. Uh, and that's the amendment. Any other discussions on the A32 Klein Amendment? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. The A32 is adopted. Senator Hochschild. Oh, hold on. I'm sorry. Senator Klein, were, were you going to say something else? Uh, vote green. All right. Senator Hochschild. Thank you, Mr. President. I have the A24 amendment. Senator Hochschild offers the A24 amendment. The secretary will report the A24 amendment. Senator Hochschild moves to amend Senate file number 4097 as follows. Page 122, delete section 3. This is the A24 amendment. Senator Hochschild to your A24 amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. This amendment simply removes section Three on page 122 related to transfers of wine. Any other discussion on the A24? Senator um, Klein. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, Senator House Child members. I urge a no vote on the amendment. Thank you. Any other discussion on the A24 amendment? Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. President, and I would ask uh, members to oppose this amendment. Um, it would strip out a common sense wine transfer bill. And I just want to talk briefly about what that bill does. Um, if we look at an example, the Fergus Falls Municipal Liquor Store has two locations in town. And if they have wine delivered to one location, um, it, they're currently unable uh, to uh, transfer any wine under any circumstances to the other location. So if they had trouble selling a particular kind of wine and it was going to expire, they cannot uh, move it even though they own the inventory. They can't return it. Um, they cannot even discount it below cost. And so this can lead to inventory management issues. So the bipartisan bill, uh, this wine transfer bill, would allow retailers to transfer a very limited amount of wine among stores of common ownership. And there's many limits in this bill to address uh, concerns that have been brought up by stakeholders. For example, there can only be one transfer per three-month period, a maximum of only uh, 75 cases. Um, and we got that number by asking a wholesaler uh, what number uh, wasn't worth their while to transport. We also, uh, from the wholesaler's request, put in a three-business-day notice in which they have to notify the regulator and the wholesaler. Uh, another request was that the retailer cannot be on the credit list and that this can only be for wine, not for beer or any other alcohol. Uh, we also um, offered to folks a right of first refusal if the wholesalers wanted to have the right to offer this and to transport this themselves, um, but they did not want to do that given the small quantities involved and that we're talking about here. Um, I think it's important to say that this bill and the reasons to support it today and oppose the amendment is that this allows very limited inventory management um, and can avoid potentially expired product uh, from going to waste. It helps consumers get the right product in the right place at the right time, and it maintains the integrity of the three-tier system. All of the wine that uh, will be sold in this instance is bought from wholesalers 
and transported by them uh, to the liquor store. Um, and to give you a sense of the, the quantity of wine that we're talking about here, um, for some retailers it could be uh, far less than 1% of the total volume that they deal with. And so I, I appreciate that uh, this wine transfer bill is included in the omnibus, and I would ask members to vote no on the House Child Amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, we are on the A24 Amendment. Any other discussion before we hear final words from the author? Senator Wiesenberg. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I also rise to say to vote no. I used to work at Westside Liquor for about five years, and there are wines that, uh, white wines specifically, if when they start getting old, they can get bad. So this would allow to move wines from one store to another. If it seems like it's not selling in one store, maybe it'll sell in a different store. And that way we're not wasting product. Uh, and like the liquor store I worked at, it was the same owner that owned it. So it's going from the same person paying the bills, it's just bringing it to another liquor store. So this is going to help stores on product and it'll help not waste product. So I would vote no to this amendment. Thank you. All right. Any other discussion on the A24 amendment? Uh, Senator Dames. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and members, and I rise in support of this amendment. And the reason I rise in support of this amendment goes back to the three-tier system. We can talk about how this is not going to interfere with the three-tier system. It's only for mom and pop shops. It's only for a couple of uh, wine stores here and a couple of wine stores there, folks. Uh, that is not the fact at all. This is the start of eroding the distribution system in the three-tier system. I understand there's a lot of concern about the three-tier system. There has been for several years. I understand that there's a lot of angst with the three-tier system and people would like it changed. But I can tell you to, leave, to start eroding it away more than we have in the past with bills like this, when you take a look, we have some large wine distributor, large wine stores in a lot of our communities, especially in Twin Cities, that have several stores. This could mean a transfers into the thousands of cases of wine a year. This also is going to interfere with the warehousing. And if this is a bill that eventually will end up having a lot of impact on mom and pop stores, this is the one that will do it. Because when you get to the changing the three-tier system, and you start eroding away with the distribution part of that three-tier system, it's much easier to buy wine in volume and get discounts, and then put it in your stores at a discounted rate, less than the mom and pop stores can do. So if you, are, if you have a problem with the three-tier system, then let's deal with the three-tier system and let's, let's take care of that. This is not the way to take care of it. This is not the bill that should be starting to erode the three-tier system where you have distribution, manufacturing, and retailing. Members, I would encourage a vote for this bill, and let's get the three-tier system talked about in committees, and let's see what can be done to change it if we have a, re if we have a reason to change it. Let's not erode it. Members, remember, we are on the A24 House Child Amendment. We are now go to Senator Pappas. Thank you, Mr. President and members. I rise to oppose the amendment. Um, I think that uh, it's very common sense to, to allow 75 cases every three months to be passed from one store to another. It's very minor. It's not going to destroy the three-tiered system. I mean, we've had these arguments over the decades about what consumers would like, what small businesses need, reasonable common sense accommodations, whether it be allowing our you know, wonderful craft brewery community to thrive, to now just this very simple proposal to allow wine transfer before white wine ages and it's not drinkable anymore. So. I think this is a very common sense proposal and I urge members to keep it in the bill. Members, remember we're on the A24 amendment. Before I go to Senator Hauschild, I have a couple other people that I'm gonna recognize unless some others wanna speak before those last two. Senator Ress. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I join um, uh, Senator Pappas in her arguments for why this um, provision needs to stay um, in the bill and um, the amendment should be uh, defeated. 
Senator Latz. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President, members. You know, when this first came to my attention, frankly, I was quite surprised. I was not familiar with the intimate operations of these organizations. I was quite surprised to find that a, an owner of several liquor stores couldn't move inventory from one store to another store to find the sweet spot, if you will, where one brand, one uh, type of wine might sell better to, in some neighborhood than it might in another neighborhood. Just like uh, Home Depot can move stuff from store to store, Walmart can move stuff from store to store. I just didn't understand it. So I, I, I decided to learn a little bit more about it. And, and you know, I'm a supporter of the three-tier system. I have been uh, uh, for many years. Um, I, I just don't see how this would be destructive to the three-tier system. It seems to me just to make sense for an owner to be able to move stuff around a little bit. Um, it's important to me that uh, the, the number of cases that were selected uh, here is apparently below the level at which the wholesalers um, and their drivers uh, would be interested in, in doing the driving on behalf of the store owners. Because uh, my suggestion was uh, let the wholesalers do the driving. Uh, let the unions that represent the drivers uh, handle that transfer. Um, and uh, so it seemed to me that that would not cause any problems either. I'll give you one last kernel. I got a, a call um, and a text. Uh, from one of my communities that has a, a two municipal liquor stores, um, and they support allowing this transfer. Uh, they want to be able to move some inventory, even if it's only a little bit, from one store to another, uh, as, as the uh, consumer demand um, would dictate. So it seems to me it makes sense to, uh, to leave it in the bill, to allow this to become law, and to oppose the amendment to delete it. Members. We are on the A24 amendment. Any other discussions before I go to the author of the, mem the amendment? I just want to remind you that I did not hear roll calls, so I just want to make sure that no one says that they requested one and I didn't hear it. If there are no other discussions, I'm going to Senator Hochschild. Thank you, Mr. President. This is a good amendment. Vote green. Thank you. Well, there's no roll call. All, all, all in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. no. The amendment is not adopted. Any other amendments? Senator Grudenhagen. Oh, thank you, Mr. President. Yeah, I have an amendment uh, A21. Senator Grudenhagen offers the A21 amendment. The secretary will report the A21 amendment. Senator Grunhagen moves to amend Senate File 4097 as follows. Page 6 after line 6, or excuse me, page 4 after line 6, insert section 3. This is amendment A21. Senator Grunhagen to your A21 amendment. Oh, thank you, Mr. President, members. Yeah, what this amendment does is uh, we voted on it last uh, session and discussed it, but during the off session, I did quite a bit of more research, okay? And uh, what I found, I worked with uh, some of the lobbyists here at the Capitol, and what I found, I, and maybe some of you got this email too, but it was sent out by one of the head lobbyists of the Hospital Association. Right now in the state of Minnesota, we have 67% of our hospitals losing money, members. 67% of our hospitals are losing money, according to the Minnesota Hospital Association. Number two, I was invited to a Zoom meeting with six CEOs from hospitals. Two of them were from the metro area, four of them were outstate, and they all said the same thing. They said that for every $2 of expenses, they get reimbursed $1 from Medicaid and Minnesota Care. So they lose money on Medicaid patients and Minnesota Care. Number two, on Medicare, out of every $2 of expenses, they, they get it reimbursed $1.50. So they still lose 50 cents uh, on every dollar of expenses for our, rural hosp for our hospitals, both metro and and rural. On private insurance, commercial insurance, 
they get reimbursed about $2.50 for every $2 of expenses. So they actually make money. Here's the problem, members. There's more and more patients being uh, re uh, reimbursing hospitals and doctors on government health insurance and less and less on private health insurance. So we are headed in a direction that is going to cause severe uh, problems in terms of access and health care for all of us and our children uh, if we keep going the direction we are. Here's some additional information that I found out, members. Um, the, um, according to the Minnesota Reformer, right now we have 63% of the doctors in the state of Minnesota under burnout. They're burnt out. They don't know if they want to stay in the profession. Some are leaving the profession earlier. And, what, and, the, and you can look that article up. And one of the main problems is the huge bureaucracy that micromanages the doctor-patient relationship tells them if, when, and how much health care they can give, depending on uh, the situation. The next thing I found out during the off-season, and this was reported by the Cicero Institute, by the year 2030, in Minnesota, we are projected to have 2,260 shortages of doctors in the state of Minnesota. I'll repeat that one more time, members. I want you to think about that. According to the Cicero Institute, and they did it for all states, you can look it up yourself, but in Minnesota, we're expected to be short 2,260 do doctors in terms of access to health care here in the state of Minnesota at a time where we have a larger senior uh, uh, population that, that, uh, from the baby boomers that are going through their senior years and are probably going to need more medical, medical care. The next thing I found out is that in, in uh, 2020, we spent $4.3 trillion on health care in the U.S members. 4.3 trillion, and of course it's gone up since then. But here's the concerning thing. Over a third of the 4.3 trillion was spent on bureaucracy to, mi to micromanage the doctor-patient relationship. Think about that. We have created, through our laws and rules, this huge bureaucracy both in the private and in government to micromanage the doctor-patient relationship and to decide if, when, and how much health care you get. So members, we are on a trajectory that is not going to see more access and necessarily better health care for all if we keep going down this path. In other words, Houston, we have a problem, okay? Now, we still have time to address it, and that's what this uh, amendment does. It's called reference-based pricing. And what it does, it comes out of a health care group think tank that I've been a, a part of for a while. And it's made of retired doctors, current doctors, and uh, insurance uh, individuals. And basically, it, it, uh, it eliminates pre-certification and networks. So you can go to any doctor or medical professional license in the state of Minnesota, and as long as it's a covered expense, um, you, the, you can see that doctor or chiropractor or whatever. And what it does, it is not subsidized with government, any type of government uh, subsidy, but it does use the Medicaid reimbursement rate as a base for reimbursing, which we know loses money for the hospital and doctor. But when you put that Medicaid rate inside of the policy, consumers or insurance customers can buy up that reimbursement rate, anywhere from a base of 190% over Medicaid all the way up possibly as high as 500%. So when you go to the doctor, instead of the bureaucracy micromanaging you, you now have a negotiation tool with the doctor on the type of plan that you have and how much it reimburses. You should see a substantial amount of reduction in premiums 
and better access to health care in the state of Minnesota and a freeing up of the doctor-patient relationship, which is what the doctors I've talked to certainly would enjoy. Um, so members, it's a new concept, but with the statistics I gave you, and you can do your own research, the direction we're going is not going to create better health care in the state of Minnesota. And this is an attempt, and it's an option, to uh, open up the, mar the private market for people under 65, both small group, large group, and individual, to reinvigorate that and have the patient, instead of a bureaucracy, decide what type of health care they want along with their doctor. Members, uh, I did uh, talk with the author of the uh, Commerce Bill. He said he kind of liked the idea, appreciated me explaining it, but that um, he didn't hear it in committee. Well, I did request a hearing, but uh, anyway, we did vote on it last year. I think this is the key, members, why I'd like to see it added to the omnibus bill and to go to conference. We need to start having a discussion about this and the direction that it goes, healthcare goes in the state of Minnesota. This is one possible option that could help and at least it starts the discussion of uh, where we're headed right now. So members, I hope uh, I've got bipartisan co-authors on here and I did change the amendment a little bit. My original mem memo said, or amendment said that health carriers may offer uh, a reference-based price uh, health plan. I heard from the other side of the aisle they would like a change from May to Shell. So I made that change in the amendment. Members, if you want a discussion about the problems we're having in health care, please vote green on this amendment. Thank you, members. Thank you, Ms. Members, any other discussion on the A21? I'm going to Senator Klein. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Grunhagen. Senator Grunhagen did bring this amendment to me before session, and I appreciate that. Uh, as I understand the reference-based pricing thing at, at the very bottom level, it would uh, have health insurance providers pay more money to doctors. So I thank Senator Grunhagen for worrying about my economic uh, stability in my own profession. In any case, it's true that the reimbursement rates to rural providers in particular are creating a crisis for rural health. Uh, it's an important problem. We need to address it. Uh, this is one potential solution. Uh, I agree that it is a new and complex problem. There are a couple issues as to why it should not be adopted as an amendment to the omnibus at this stage. Uh, it will uh, likely require a federal waiver, uh, which would also imply a fiscal note. There will need to be regulatory oversight of the new arrangement, and that will also generate a fiscal note. Uh, it should certainly be heard not only in the Commerce Committee, but also in the Health and Human Services Committee, and that has not been done. I'm also a bit concerned that it may create an exception to network adequacy requirements for network development that we currently rely on. Um, and so, members, I'm going to urge a, a no vote on the amendment. Any other discussion on the A21 amendment before we go to uh, the author? Senator uh, Liskey. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I rise in favor of the A21 amendment, and uh, there's a couple of reasons why. Uh, I know that in committee in Health and Human Services, we've talked a lot about how do we make health care more affordable. Um, and so looking through this and understanding the very fine details of this amendment and actually how this would work, it actually would cut out a significant amount of costs on the in, uh, insurance side as the fact that it would remove a lot of barriers that are in place. Um, third party payers generally get in the way. I know those are a lot of things that are things that people don't understand, but basically as a provider myself, I send my, my, my bill off after I've seen a patient, uh, treated a patient, send the bill off, it goes to the insurance company. They send that bill over to a third party payer. Third party payer says, yes, uh, Dr. Liskey is in network yes, you need to pay it. So then they send it back to the provider, the provider sends it to me, and then finally I get payment. As you can imagine, that's a pretty significant amount of time and costs money. Not only that, but then the third party payer takes a ch chunk out of my check on the back side saying, hey, we did our service, we told them that yes, you're in network, now it's gonna cost an extra dollar and 40 something cents, which of course then gets passed on to the patient. Um, so 
in this way, I, I truly support the, the approach that this is trying to do, and uh, I look, urge a green vote. Any other discussion on the A21 amendment before I go to the author for final comments? And just so that folks know, I want to make sure that there's no roll call that has been requested. And so, so I just want to make sure that someone doesn't say that they requested one and I did not honor it. Seeing none, I'm going down to the uh, author of the amendment, Senator Grudenhagen. Oh, thank you, Mr. President. Yeah, I would ask for a roll call. Roll call requested, roll call granted. Senator Grudenhagen. Oh, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, members, for this discussion. You know, again, do your research on the direction we're headed on our healthcare, uh, it, uh, healthcare uh, industry here in the state of Minnesota. You know, the more government you, you infuse into the system, the less reimbursement there's going to be. We're already projected to have uh, over 2,200 shortage of doctors in the state of Minnesota, which is going to affect all of us in terms of access. And you add to that uh, the, um, the loss of money at hospitals on the government reimbursement. This is a step towards a direction of eliminating pre-certification and networks. You will have the freedom and liberty to go to the doctor of your choice. And if he's willing to accept the reimbursement rate that you purchase on your individual small group or large group plan, you don't have to deal with the network. You don't have to go through the process that uh, uh, Senator Liskey talked about to get reimbursed. So members, I ask for a green vote and that we would please send it along to the omnibus for further discussion uh, in the conference committee. So members, please vote green. The secretary would take the roll on the A21 amendment. Members, please vote. Senator Kunis, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Mr. President, Senator Dietzik votes no. Senator Dietzik votes no. And Senator Port votes no. And Senator Port votes no. Senator Jasinski, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Duckworth votes aye. Senator Duckworth votes aye. And thank you, Mr. President. Senator Miller votes aye. And Senator Miller votes aye. All senators having voted who desires to vote, the secretary will close the roll. And Senator Nelson has been asked to be excused. All senators voting who had a desire to vote, there being 33 ayes and 33 noes, the A21 amendment fails. Any other amendments? Senator Latz. Mr. President, I have the A31 amendment. Senator Lass offers the A31 amendment. The secretary will report the A31 amendment. Senator Latz moves to amend Senate file number 4097 as follows. Pages 52 to 63, delete sections 32 to 38, and insert. 
This is the A31 amendment. Senator Latz, to your A31 amendment. Uh, Mr. President, uh, this amendment um, inserts the, uh, replaces the placeholder language that's in the omnibus bill uh, with a stakeholder agreement language on bail bond standards and regulations. Uh, there was a 2015 consent decree uh, between the Commissioner of Commerce um, and uh, the bail bond industry um, that uh, uh, binds only those signatories to the consent decree. Uh, the desire here is to codify the terms of that consent decree so uh, any industry participants um, who are not covered by the consent decree uh, now or any who enter uh, into the bail bond industry will also be covered by these terms. Um, under these terms, uh, companies must charge the approved rates and follow strict rules for documenting payments from customers. They're prohibited from soliciting businesses at the courthouse or jail property. Um, the insurance companies and bail bond companies um, uh, are uh, prohibited from paying kickbacks to the jailers or others in the system. Um, and uh, the insurance companies also have to audit their contract to bail bond companies and agents for compliance uh, audits, which are released then to the Department of Commerce. Uh, so um, this is an agreement of all the stakeholders. Um, it uh, contains consumer protection, uh, the standards and protocols of the industry uh, all being codified now. Appreciate your support. Senator Klein, on the A31 amendment. Yes, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator uh, Latz, for working with stakeholders on this uh, arrangement. This is a, a great amendment, uh, and it has the support of the various participants in this industry. It will create protections for Minnesotans uh, by codifying across the board uh, existing protections, essentially, uh, for people who uh, require the uh, services of a bail bondsman. Uh, so vote yes. Senator Dames. Well, thank you, Mr. President, members, and I would uh, like to thank Senator Latz for uh, working to get this uh, completed and get this brought together. This bill did come in Commerce Committee, and it was passed out of Commerce Committee, and we had, uh, as what we thought, we had a piece in the valley, and then it kind of fell apart after it got out of Commerce Committee. So thank you, Senator Latz, for getting the stakeholders all together, getting this ironed out, and I think it's a good piece, of, it's a good amendment makes for good legislation, and the stakeholders are all in agreement. So uh, thank you, Senator Latz, for bringing this forward. I'd urge a green vote. Any other discussion on the A31 amendment? Seeing, what, seeing none, any final comments, Senator Latz? He has no final comments. All in favor of adoption of the A31 amendment, say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. The A31 amendment is adopted. Senator Nelson. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I have the A26 amendment. Senator Nelson offers the A26 amendment. The, the secretary will report the A26 amendment. Senator Nelson moves to amend Senate File 4097 as follows. Page 123 after line 28, insert section 8. This is amendment A26. Senator Nelson, to your A26 amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. President and members. Uh, this amendment is a special liquor law, much like the others that we are passing in this bill. This one is for the city of Rochester. It has the same uh, language uh, regarding those type of town ball liquor licenses. Um, and this is for soccer. Senator Klein to the A26 amendment. Uh, members, Senator, uh, President Senator Nelson, Senator Nelson did bring this to me ahead of time. Uh, we did hear a, a few of these in a bipartisan way uh, in our committee this year, sort of one-time liquor licenses for various organizations or establishments. Uh, this is of a kind with those, and I told her I would support it. Uh, after I made that commitment to Senator Nelson, a flurry of other sort of single-issue liquor license requests came to me, and I had to tell those authors that, uh, you know, in future we need to hear these in committee to, to approve them. But uh, in keeping with my sort of commitment to Senator Nelson, I'm going to support this amendment today uh, and uh, urge a green vote. Any other discussion on the A26 amendment? Any final words, Senator Nelson, as the author? Oh, thank you, Mr. President. I also encourage a green vote. All in favor of adoption of the A26 amendment, say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails, the A26 is adopted. Any other amendments? Senator Westrom. 
Mr. President, I'd move the A-29 amendment. Senator Westrom moves the A-29 amendment. The Secretary will uh, report the A-29 amendment. Senator Westrom moves to amend Senate File 4097 as follows. Page 122, after line 4, insert Section 3. This is Amendment A-29. Senator Westrom, to your A-29 amendment. Uh, Mr. President, uh, members, uh, I'm going to try my luck here, but uh, this amendment uh, came to me uh, well into the session, or this language uh, that I've, I'm offering, but um, ran it by uh, Senator Klein as well. But members, what this would do is allow municipalities to work out an arrangement or grant a license for a food truck, a uh, licensed food truck that's a business in their community doing uh, events that are either out of their food truck location where they're at or a private contracted uh, um, catering event. Uh, food trucks are certainly a new style or a new uh, form of uh, common business that we've all uh, seen over the years uh, develop, a little more mobile, a little uh, unique or different uh, type of uh, business or a way to offer your services, but certainly a good option for choice and consumers, and so uh, this would allow municipalities to grant a license if they so choose. Does have uh, restrictions, prov provisions that they'd have to have license or, and insu or insurance, uh, uh, just like other uh, providers of that that would be uh, selling alcohol or uh, beverages like that. Again, up to the local municipality or the county, depending upon where the event is going to be. There'd also have to be notice of the local police to police chief, and um, uh, set forth those uh, pr parameters, uh, which are, are guardrails for the municipality to uh, work, work with uh, food trucks if they so cho chose. And so, uh, Senator Klein, I'd be happy to get your comments and observations. Members, you've maybe had similar requests uh, as this uh, food truck industry develops. It hadn't even occurred to me that this would be a request until it came through from my constituents. Uh, and so I, I'd, heard, I'd hope you could uh, give this uh, due consideration and uh, something, another unique uh, situation that we could address. Senator Klein, we're on the A29 amendment. Senator Klein. Thank you, Senator Champion, President Champion, and Senator Westrom. And uh, I, if members that this came to us very late, it would be a pretty substantial change in uh, the policy of liquor in the state of Minnesota. If it goes to a vote, I am actually going to ask for a red vote uh, and, um, and ask for a roll call. But I'm going to ask Senator Westrom if he would consider withdrawing it because I think it has merit. I think it might be a step forward for uh, food trucks in the state of Minnesota. Uh, and I would be grateful to give it a hearing in my committee, uh, you know, next year and consider it for the omnibus. Uh, but if we do go to a vote, I'll request a roll call and, uh, and vote no. Roll call requested, a roll call granted. Any other discussions on the A29 before we go to the author of the A29 amendment? Any other discussions? Seeing that, I'm going to the author, uh, Senator Westrom. Mr. Uh, President, uh, I would withdraw the A29 amendment. Uh, did want to bring it up for discussion. Appreciate uh, Senator Klein's uh, interest in it and uh, something uh, we're going to get turned into the a bill introduction and uh, uh, work from there. Thank you. The A29 has been withdrawn. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. President. I would offer the A23 amendment, and I'm happy Senator to Senator Rasmussen explain. offers the A23 amendment. The Secretary will report the A23 amendment. Senator Rasmussen moves to amend Senate file number 4097 as follows. Page 83, delete subdivision 4. This is the A23 amendment. Senator Rasmussen to your A23 amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. The A23 uh, is concerning a bill on cryptocurrency kiosks that Senator McEwen has been working on. And I do appreciate her collaborative work with different stakeholders on this bill. Uh, the amendment before the Senate would remove a 48-hour holding period uh, for new customers in which they could reverse and cancel their transaction. And I think Senator McEwen has very good intent with this bill to try to prevent uh, consumer fraud involving cryptocurrency. However, I'm concerned about how the mechanics of this 48-hour hold period could work. 
Uh, one example, Mr. President, would be if you had a consumer uh, go to one of these kiosks to purchase cryptocurrency, and over 48 hours, the price of that cryptocurrency went down, and they simply had buyer's remorse that they could go back to the kiosk and request a full refund, even though the price had gone down. Um, I know Senator McEwen is uh, committed to continuing to work on this, but I think for now it makes sense to uh, remove this 48-hour hold. The bill will still contain uh, daily maximum transaction limits of $2,000 for a new customer, um, but this 48-hour uh, holding period I think could have some issues and needs some more work um, that could be discussed in conference committee. Senator McEwen, on the A23 Amendment. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Rasmussen, for the discussion that we've had about this bill and, and in particular, um, the amendment that you're bringing forward. Members, I am going to ask uh, at this point that uh, we reject this amendment. Uh, I am actually having a meeting this afternoon um, to talk about some of the provisions in the bill, so I will just begin by saying that the conversation is ongoing about a couple of provisions. Uh, however, Deleting this 48-hour period is too much and goes too far. Uh, I brought this bill uh, forward, and I'm very grateful to Senator Klein for including it in the omnibus bill. Uh, I was, it was brought to me after a constituent of mine experienced a devastating financial scam. And as we did some research into this issue, we found out that this was happening throughout our state. And so I have teamed up with um, some of the members of the Department of Commerce, uh, from people from the Attorney General's office, uh, House representatives, and working on this issue together, also with industry, the industry that's involved with this. The industry is not asking for this 48-hour period to be deleted uh, because they recognize how important it is. There's a crucial period with these scams, they rely on a sense of urgency on the part of the person who is being scammed. And so again and again, we've heard, if I had just had a day or two, I probably could have realized after talking to some more people that this just wasn't right, that there was something wrong with this. Um, so having that time period open where they're going to be able to receive their money back to be whole again is critical. And, and so deleting it entirely is too much, respectfully. I ask for a no vote on this, and I do request a roll call, um, Mr. President. And, um, but I will be continuing the discussions with the stakeholders on this. And uh, if we have a, a compromise, we will certainly be bringing that in conference. Thank you. A, a roll call was requested, and a roll call was granted. Any other discussions on the A23 before I go back to the author of the A23 amendment? Anyone else before I go to, go to the author for final comments before we vote? Seeing none, Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. President, and I do appreciate Senator McEwen's commitment to continue to work with stakeholders on this uh, language, but, but I don't, Mr. President, think it's prudent for this body uh, to uh, pass a, a key provision of this bill before we yet understand and know how the details of it are going to work. And my concern with this, Mr. President, is if you had a consumer go and have uh, $100 where they purchase cryptocurrency and the price goes down to $70 over the course of 48 hours, that they would come and simply just have buyer's remorse and ask for that money back. And from the language here, it's unclear in terms of who would actually have to pay for that difference. Would it be the kiosk? Would it be the consumer that would be out that money? Um, and so I would request uh, member support of this uh, amendment, and, and we can continue to talk to stakeholders, but I don't think it's wise to move this from the Senate floor today before we have those details figured out. So I'd, I'd request member support. The secretary will take the roll on the A23 amendment. <laughs> Members, please vote. Senator Kunis, for those voting pursuant to Rule 40.7. Mr. President, Senator Dietzik votes no. Senator Dietzik votes no. And Senator Port votes no. And Senator Port votes no. Senator Jasinski. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Duckworth votes aye. Senator Duckworth votes aye. And thank you, Mr. President. Senator Miller votes aye. And Senator Miller votes aye. All senators having voted who desires to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There have been 33 ayes and 34 noes. The A23 amendment is not adopted. Any other amendments? Any other amendments? Third reading. Senate file number 4097, a bill for an act relating to commerce, adding and modifying various provisions related to insurance. Third reading. Any other discussion? Uh, Senator Dames. Well, thank you, Mr. President, and I'd just like to rise in support of this bill uh, and thank Senator, uh, yeah, Senator Klein for putting this together. There's certainly some things in here that I'm not real excited about, but there's some other provisions in here that uh, will help a lot to the various industries. Uh, there's some provisions that will help the consumers of the insurance industry. There's certainly some provisions in the financial part of it that are some pretty darn good provisions and some of the new, uh, some of the departments, uh, Department of Commerce's regulations and stuff that they wanted passed are in here that uh, strengthen those areas. Uh, certainly uh, there's some other provisions in here that are some pretty strong provisions that certainly should help us in the long run. So I'd like to thank Dr. Klein and his uh, group for putting this together. We do appreciate it and I would urge a green vote on this bill. Thank you. Members, remember we're on final passage of, uh, of Senate File 4097 as amended. I'm going to Senator Kroon. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, would uh, Senator Umu Verbaten yield for a question? Senator Umu Verbaten, will you yield? She will yield. Senator Kroon. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm looking at the provision in the bill with the, uh, the student loan servicer, which is uh, on page 84 of the bill. Um, section 12 and section 13 and this wasn't within our jurisdiction and judiciary so I'm looking at this now and um, I'm wondering if you could give me an example when when would a student loan servicer secure make or extend a student loan Senator Umu Verbaden to Senator Kroon's question Thank you, Mr. President, uh, Senator Kroon. Just uh, to provide some background, this provision, the Student Loan uh, Borrower's Bill of Rights, is a bill that was originally passed in 2021. Uh, the bill that I brought forward this year provided some expansion um, on reporting requirements on a private right of action um, that we did also here in the Judiciary Committee, uh, but that originally started in the Commerce Committee. The purpose of the bill is to ensure that when student loan servicers and lenders um, who provide loans to borrowers um, engage in sort of predatory practices and don't hold up um, their end of the bargain are held accountable. So um, the securing, making, extending of student loans, um, there are private lenders who offer loans to potential borrowers, and then there are student loan servicers uh, who the federal government contracts with to provide those student loans to borrowers. So really it's the practice of uh, providing those those loans to borrowers, and this bill is providing uh, more accountability so that they are doing what they are supposed to be doing um, and giving folks the access to the in income different repay repayment plans that they're supposed to. Um, and when they don't do that, the Department of Commerce, the Attorney General's Office, and those borrowers themselves can hold them accountable through a private right of action. Senator Kroon. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Umar Verbaten. I, I think I understand the intent of the bill, um, but what I'm wondering about here is in lines uh, 84.12 in particular, which uh, sets up an annual report for student loan servicers. A student loan servicer 
uh, under uh, the existing definition and statute in 58B.02 subdivision 9 means any person wherever located responsible for the servicing of any student loan to any borrower, including a non-bank covered person as defined in the Code of Federal Regulations. And student loan servicing, as I understand that, is not an entity that provides loans to the borrowers. Student loan servicer collects your student loan bills, keeps track of whether you pay them on time. Uh, they also help borrowers uh, switch repayment plans, certify for forgiveness programs. Um, they can also facilitate deferments and forbearances. But a student loan servicer does not own the loan. It doesn't hold the loan. It has no legal interest in the loans. They're merely servicers. And so that was the basis for my question because I can't understand, I can't think of any example where a student loan servicer would secure, make, or extend a student loan as that's defined in 84.12 and 84.13. Um, and I, I don't know if, 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 in light of my explanation there, if you, if you have a, a response or any examples of where a servicer, as opposed to a lender, where a servicer would secure, make, or extend a student loan. So if Senator Umu Verbaten would yield for another question. Senator Umu Verbaten, will you yield for a question? She will yield. Did you hear the question, Senator Umu Verbaten? She heard the question. Senator Umu Verbaten is being recognized. Thank you, Mr. President, Senator Kroon. Um, so the, when folks apply for uh, student loans through the federal government, when it then comes time to start repaying those loans, those loans are sent to servicers. Um, there are a number of different servicers that the federal government works for, um, but those are the, the servicers are the ones that borrowers are interacting with when they're making those payments. Um, so we do need to have this legislation in place to have those guardrails, to have those protections uh, for borrowers who are trying to pay off their student loans. They have to work with the servicers. That is who the federal government has uh, charged with um, you know, sort of taking care of that loan and the, that repayment process for them. Senator Kroon. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Umu Verbaten. Um, I understand that the borrower has to work with the servicer, but um, again, I don't believe in this whole annual report in Subdivision 10 in this bill set is prefaced and it only requires student loan servicers who secure, make, or extend student loans. That's the whole basis of it. And in my reading of this, there isn't a student loan servicer who would ever secure, make, or extend a student loan, rendering this entire section meaningless. So that was the purpose of my question. And that's particularly uh, true when you look at lines 84.3 of the bill that defines um, what, a, what a lender means. And it uses the exact same language as uh, the student loan servicers down in 84.13. It says a student loan lender means an entity engaged in the business of securing, making, or extending student loans. And that's accurate. That's what a student loan lender does. It's not what a student loan servicer does. And so um, I think, you know, that this bill is gonna need some work over the uh, before next session, because I don't think the re annual report in here does anything, because student loan servicers don't secure, make, or extend student loans. Um, so that's my comment, and I think this should have been more thoroughly vetted in judiciary and should have been within our jurisdiction, but it was being heard on deadline day, probably like about a half hour before deadline, and uh, it went through. But um, I'm not sure how, what position this is going to put our uh, student loan servicers in, whether they are going to be um, bound to do these annual reports, what, the, what they're going to do with that, but I thought I would flag that issue and hope that we can work together on changing that before next year. Thank you, Mr. President. Any other discussion uh, on Senate File 4097 as amended? We're on final passage. I want to make sure I recognize individuals before we go to the author. I see Senator Rasmussen. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, 
One of the more interesting bills that we heard in the Senate Commerce Committee this year was Senator Klein's event ticket sales bill. Um, we, we definitely heard a lot of Taylor Swift lyrics as that bill was being presented and discussed in, in committee. One of the pieces of this bill and the goal of the bill is to try to help whether they be concert goers or sporting event attendees to have a good experience and to not have a bad consumer experience dealing with ticket marketplaces or resellers. One of the concerns that I have with the current bill is that it per could perhaps create a competitive advantage uh, for the largest ticket marketplace, uh, given that the bill gives certain rights uh, two venues, and this very large uh, ticket marketplace oftentimes will have ownership stakes in these venues, and this bill could perhaps give them an advantage uh, in the marketplace against their competitors. And so Mr. President wanted to ask if Senator Klein would yield for a question. Senator Klein, will you yield? He will yield for a question. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Klein. And I appreciate the conversations that we've had on this bill and on this issue. And Senator Klein, just wanted to ask if, if you're committed to continuing to work on this bill to make sure that we're not picking winners or losers um, uh, in the ticket marketplace if this bill does become law this session. Senator Klein, to the question. Uh, Mr. President, Senator Rasmussen, yes. Uh, so we uh, were careful in the bill to uh, examine when a, a ticket selling uh, entity such as Ticketmaster has a dual role as also a ticket reseller and make sure that they didn't have a contractual advantage by ab being able to negotiate essentially with themselves to obtain certain marketplace advantages. Uh, Senator Rasmussen correctly pointed out that some of these ticket sales entities are also venue owners or operators, uh, and so they would also have that potential for a dual relationship and the ability to self-negotiate. I think it's a legitimate concern. Uh, he was able to present to me the case that uh, Ticketmaster in particular owns two venues in the state of Minnesota and could contractually obtain an advantage with themselves. Uh, it's not addressed in our bill. I think there probably is a way to address it, and I'm committed to working for it uh, in conference. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. President, and I appreciate uh, Senator Klein's commitment to working on this, and I look forward to continued conversations. Uh, Mr. President, I look forward to supporting the bill today, and I appreciate the work of Chair Klein, Senator Dames, both of their leadership on this committee, and all the members uh, for the collaborative debate and discussion that we have in the Senate Commerce Committee. And if you look at the bills that are included in this omnibus, it's, it's bipartisan, but even within those bills, there are many uh, amendments that were adopted uh, through conversations with stakeholders, through testimony. And so I appreciate all the work that has gone into this bill, um, and I will be voting in favor of it today. Senator Mann. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I just wanted to quickly uh, thank Senator Dr. Klein for, um, and the members of the Commerce Committee uh, for inclusion of Senate File 3972. We've known for a long time that people in Minnesota are dying from the abuse of inhalants that contain fluorinated hydrocarbons called difluoroethane or DFE. Uh, DFE is a liquefied gas found um, uh, found in cans of compressed air used to clean or dust electronic equipment, and people are inhaling these products and becoming addicted and dying. Uh, so the consumer protections in this bill uh, will save lives. And again, I, I just really appreciate its inclusion. I want to thank the business community for acknowledging the dangers of these products and being so fully on board and working with us to craft language to protect children and protect consumers. Um, and lastly, and most importantly, I just wanted to thank and acknowledge the families who are in the gallery today today, uh, families who have lost loved ones to this product, um, to addiction and the use of this drug. And I want to thank you guys for shining a huge spotlight on this issue so that no other family has to go through what you have gone through. So thank you. Senator Umu Verbaden. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm glad we were able to speak um, briefly about the Student Loan Borrowers Bill of Rights, but I just want to thank uh, Senator Klein for including this in the Consumer Protection Omnibus. This is a huge issue really impacting my generation in particular. We are trying to pay off our student loans, and we should be able to rely on servicers to do the right thing, but they are not. Um, and we have seen that in the six months since student loan repayments have resumed. There are countless examples from 
just one servicer, Mohila, of how they have messed this up. They have created a backlog of over 800,000 public service loan forgiveness program forms. They have incorrectly calculated the number of qualifying public service loan forgiveness payments borrowers have made. They've denied the public service credit to borrowers working for qualified employers. They've kept borrowers waiting up to nine hours on their customer service line. And they have internal documents showing that they encourage their staff to participate in a call defection, deflection scheme. They've miscalculated over 400,000 payments for borrowers. In just the month of October 2023 alone, errors of up to $10,000 in some cases, and they failed to send timely billing notices to 2.5 million borrowers. Worst part about this is they are the exclusive servicer for all public service loan forgiveness participants, including myself. Uh, so it's very personal to me. We need to hold these servicers accountable. These are predatory practices, um, and that's what this bill is gonna do. I encourage members to vote yes. Any other discussions on Senate File 4097 as amended before I go to the author of the bill for final comments before we vote for final passage? Seeing none, Senator Klein. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, members of the committee. And the, the highlights of the bill have been pointed out. I won't repeat them. I'm grateful for the bipartisan work and support and encouragement to make this an excellent bill for Minnesotans. A couple of specific thank yous. I want to thank uh, my ICA, Bill Lunzer, my LA, Tyler Klein, our researchers, Amanda Peterson and Linnea Michelson, our counsel, Olivia Siverson, and our fiscal analyst, Hannah grunwald Noldner. Uh, the members of my committee, Ranking Member Dames, Senator Duckworth, Senator Rasmussen, Senator Howell, Vice Chair Seberger, Senator Latz, Senator Wickland, Senator Rest, Senator Frentz, grateful for all your work this session in producing a good bill, and I uh, ask for your green vote. The Secretary will take the roll on final passage of Senate File 4097 as amended. <laughs> Members, please vote. Senator Kunis, for those voting pursuant to Rule 40.7. Mr. President, Senator Dietzik votes aye. Senator Dietzik votes aye. And Senator Port votes aye. And Senator Port votes aye. Senator Jasinski, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Duckworth votes aye. Senator Duckworth votes aye. And thank you, Mr. President. Senator Miller votes aye. And Senator Miller votes aye. All members having voted who desires to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There have been 53 ayes and 14 noes. Senate file 4097 as amended, passed, and its title agreed to. Members, we will now proceed to House File 3377, Senator Herr for the Environmental and Natural Resources Trust Fund Appropriation and Modification. Senator Herr. Thank you, Mr. President, and I hope that this one will get super majority like the previous bill as well. And congratulations to Senator Klein, Senator Hoffman, uh, and previous bill authors, um, Senator Putnam. Um, Members and Mr. President, before you is House File 3377. It is the 2024 LCCMR bill, our Legislative Citizen Commission on Minnesota Resources bill. This bill contained 101 environment and natural resources projects across our state, totaling $79.644 million to receive funding from the Environmental Trust Fund. Each of the 101 projects was submitted last year and vetted during the summer of 2023 by the Legislative Citizen Commission on Minnesota Resources Committee. Before I explain the bill further, let me give you a little background on the Environmental Natural Resource Trust Fund and the 
LCCMR committee. In 1988, Minnesota voters approved the, a constitutional amendment establishing the Envir Environment and Natural Resource Trust Fund with the purpose to provide a long-term and stable source of funding for activities that protect, conserve, preserve, and enhance Minnesota air, water, land, fish, wildlife, and other natural resources for the benefit of current and future Minnesotans. The funding source originated from Minnesota state lottery proceed. The Legislative Citizen Commission on Minnesota Resource was then formed to review the project seeking funding from, from the ENRTF and making funding recommendation to the legislature. The commission has 17 members, five senators, five House of Representatives, five citizens appointed by the governor, one citizen appointed by the Senate, and one citizen appointed by the House. I'd like to acknowledge the current Sen uh, Senate LCCMR member, uh, which includes Senator Dietzett, Senator Green, Senator Morrison, and Senator Westrom, who participate in generating the recommendation before you today. I also want to acknowledge uh, Senator Dame, who has been a, a longtime past member of this committee. A list of all members are on your desk. A special thanks to LCCM Director Becca Nash and Senior Project Analyst Mike Capana and the LCCMR staff. Although this is a concurrent House bill, the Senate Companion had been discussed and passed our Environment, Climate, and Legacy Committee and Finance Committee as well. So here we are, House File 3377, contained 101 projects, again totaling 79.644 million. The projects are spread across our state, from urban core to greater Minnesota, and deliver a host of environment and natural resources priorities, from harmful algal blooms, microplastics, plastic, PFAS, and road salt, to conservation gazing, urban forest, shoreline restoration, creating opportunities for family fishing, and continue funding for our state preeminent terrestrial invasive pest and plants research center at the University of Minnesota. So member, I ask for your support of this bill, the LCCM bill of 2024. Thank you. Members, we are on House File 3377. Any discussions or amendments? Seeing none, oh, uh, Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. President, I just want to make sure that we're going to be able to discuss this at third reading. I don't think anybody, or, or do we have amendments? Okay, I guess there's amendments. I apologize for that. So. Senator Riesenberg. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'd like to talk about my amendment here. Uh, it is the A1 amendment. Senator Wiesenberg offers the A1 amendment. The Secretary will report the A1 amendment. Senator Wiesenberg moves to amend House File Number 3377 as follows. Page 2, line 11, delete. This is the A1 amendment. Senator Wiesenberg, to your A1 amendment. So science is a study of knowledge, and in that, we ask questions and we answer questions. In the state of Minnesota, when we answer a question that isn't liked by certain groups of people, we just ignore it and we just keep doing studies, and then we do more studies, and then we do more studies. We know the answers to questions, so we need to work on fulfilling that to help animals. When we, when we get to a population of animals and we've saved it, we need to understand then that we might have to manage it somehow. So this is going to be talking about loons and eagles. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of information from the Minnesota Breeding Bird Atlas. This is updated, it's current from 2024. 
the population of loons in the United States is estimated, so it's 620,000 adults. And the population is actually increasing in Minnesota and Michigan and Canadian provinces. There's a study of loons done in the New England states over a 14-year period. Yeah, this is a PubMed article if you want to research it. We found that out of 522 loons that were found dead, it was estimated that 44% were killed by lead. Now that seems like a lot. It ends up being about 16.4 loons per year. So over 14 years, that was 230 loons that died. So the total population of loons that died from lead poisoning was 0.0002645% of the total population. That's statistically not a reason to ban lead or continue to study the effects of lead on loons. In Minnesota, the MPCA in 2003 found 101 dead loons and seven were killed by lead. So out of the 200 or 620,000 birds, that's 0.000011 loons died of lead in Minnesota. I'm not saying that I want animals to die. I'm not saying it's, it's fun that this happens, but it's just a fact. We hunt, we fish, these things happen. And as a matter of fact, through hunting and fishing, that money goes to protect these species. And if we didn't have that money, these populations would actually be lower than they are right now. So the hunters are the ones conserving these species. Um, and you know, one reason we have less dying probably in Minnesota is we have more lakes. They're spread out more than maybe in the eastern states. So in doing this research, I found it inter interesting that this year on March 5th, and show me the news, there was a snowy owl that was hit by a train. And this one snowy owl died. The population of snowy owls in North America is 28,000 birds. That's 0.0003571% of the snowy, snowy owl population was killed by trains this year. So that is three times as many snowy owls get killed by trains as loons dying from lead. Now, are we going to are we going to outlaw trains? Probably not, because it's just a fact of life. Uh, and if you drive down roads, I notice because I'm a wildlife biologist, I know what eagles look or uh, owls look like. Owls are hit all the time by cars, so it's just a thing. We're not going to outlaw driving cars either. So I'm going to get to my amendment. My amendment would delete the language where we're asking $254,000. To, to do take out the lead and say we need to have uh, two hundred fifty four thousand dollars to the from two hundred fifty four thousand dollars the sec for the second year is from the trust fund to the commissioner of natural resources to study the impact the eagles have on loons in this state the study must include an assessment of the impact the presence of bald eagles have on the juvenile loons and on the loon population generally and must be completed by March first of 2020, 20, 2027. So this last summer, I went to four different lake association meetings, and well, from spring through fall, and there was a resounding message that was the same, is everybody that lives on a lake was seeing eagles eat baby loons. Now we're saying we're seeing less loons, but we won't do a study on the eagles that are eating them. Now back in 2007, uh, I don't have to look it up, I know, the, I know what's in my head. So back in 2007, there were 2,300 breeding pairs of eagles in Minnesota. Today, there's over 10,000 breeding pairs of eagles in Minnesota, so an extra 8,000 breeding pairs of eagles in the state. Now, they need to eat, and eagles are fish birds, so they eat on lakes. And when adult loons go hunting, they leave their babies floating on the surface, and there's nothing to protect them. So it would be very easy to concur that the eagles could fly down and scoop up a baby loon and eat it. And in, you get, don't have to concur it because the people that live on leaks are seeing it happen. So that's what this needs, we need to do that. We need to do this study. We need to look at how many loons are getting eaten by eagles because it's science and it's happening. So you can ignore it, that's fine, um, but I hope we don't. I hope we can pass this amendment. I hope we can actually do science. We hope we can listen to the people that are on lakes and we know that these animals aren't dying. There's actually an upward trend of loons in the state and in the northern hemisphere and I would hope that we vote yes on this amendment. Thank you. Members, we're on the A1 amendment. I'm going to Senator Howell for his response to the A1 amendment. Senator. I'm sorry, Senator Herr. I'm thinking of the H's. I see you right there, my good friend. Senator Herr. <laughs> uh, th thank you, Mr. President. And uh, I uh, appreciate uh, 
Senator Wiesenberg amendment, uh, it's not a bad idea, a bad proposal, but number one is like, I'd like to protect the integrity of the LCCR bill here, because we spent a whole year, uh, those who are uh, citizen members and the legislators spend pretty much a whole year, and mainly during the summer to vet through, so that's my number one defense of, uh, against his amendment. And the, the, the second one is that um, Sam Wiesenberg, we plan to schedule your amendment here, which is in, already in, in the bill form, for a hearing at some point this session. And so I l would like to know more about it too, so I would ask that you could withdraw this bill and so that we can have more time because the reason your bill, is, this, this amendment was not heard, or bill was not heard, is because we had to cancel committee last Tuesday. So uh, the more time we have for committee, the more chance of we having time to hear your bill. Uh, with that, I also uh, want to see if Senator Wiesenberg will yield. Senator Wiesenberg, will you yield to Senator Herr? He will yield. Senator Herr. Uh, Mr. President and Senator Wiesenberg, uh, there has been a study done by uh, USGS, uh, uh, the uh, United States uh, Geological Survey, very much on the same issue, the correlation between loon and eagle. Um, and uh, the study doesn't show much uh, notable impact uh, between the decline of the loon population. You know, are you aware of this? Uh, study and and what's the difference between that study and the one that you're proposing? Senator Wiesenberg to Senator Herr's question. I am not aware of this study. Um, I haven't read about that. Uh, I was just listening to people on lakes and you know what they've told me. So it seems like a study that we should do. Um, I have worked with multiple people in multiple agencies and I would have to read the study. I would have to see who actually did the science to know if they actually know what they're doing. I'd have to see where they went to school to see if they were taught how to actually do science correctly also. Um, but I, I, I'm assuming they, I don't know if they did or not, but eagles are being eaten, or sorry, loons are being eaten by eagles. That's what people that live on lakes are seeing. That They literally are watching them, watching it happen. So in Minnesota, there are more eagles that are eating loons then loons are dying from lead poisoning. That's the point. So it, we just need to study it so we know what's going on. But no, I haven't seen that study. Thank you. Senator Herr. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Mr. Uh, Senator Wiesenberg. Um, I, I'll share with you at a later point. Um, my answer now is to ask member to vote no for your amendment unless you withdraw and uh, so that we can create a different path. Perhaps it will end up in our environment on the bus finance bill. Um, so uh, if you withdraw, we will go take that route. But if you uh, want to push for the amendment, I'd like uh, our body here to vote no, mainly to protect the integrity of our LCCR bill. And just so we're clear, there's been no roll call requested. And, and now I'm going to Senator Wiesenberg. What well, Senator Hur yield for a question? Senator Hur, will you yield? He will yield. Senator Wiesenberg. Uh, Senator Hur, would you say today, right now, that you'll hear this bill this year in Environment Committee and then help me get it heard in uh, whatever path it needs to take? Thank you. Uh, Senator Hur, to uh, Senator Wiesenberg's question. Yes, uh, Senator Wiesen Wiesenberg is, has been scheduled on Tuesday, but due to our canceling of committee um, we're planning for today, uh, but uh, we already have our full agenda, so hopefully Tuesday or sometime next week we'll be scheduling your bill for the hearing. Senator Wiesenberg. Um, I will withdraw my amendment as long as he promises to cook me some squirrel. The A1 amendment has been withdrawn. Thank you. Any other amendments? On the uh, on House File 3377, before we go to third reading, Senator Acorn. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, would Senator Hur yield for a question? 
Senator Hur, will you yield? He will yield. Senator Eichhorn. Uh, Mr. President, Senator Hur, I just wanted to ask about the emerging issues section of the bill. I see we've got 1,071,000 for emerging issues. Can you speak to that and what those emerging, uh, it, what, kind of, what kind of things those emerging issues could be used for? Senator Hur, to the question. It seems he needs a minute. Will you give him just a moment? Senator Herr. Thank, thank you, uh, Senator Eichhorn, for bringing that question. You know, um, I, was, I thought it was in a section of the bill, but it's kind of um, scattered with the bill. So my train, train of thought was a little awry there, but now I'm, I'm in context right now. The emerging issue or, or project that arise uh, during the interim. So the, uh, the LCCMR committee are charter with flexibility to uh, create funding for in case there are emerging issues coming up and um, are open to, to, to improve, to approve. Senator Eichhorn. Thank you, Mr. President, Senator Herr. Um, thank you for the answer to that. And I, and I kind of knew a little bit what it was for. And, and just a little bit jokingly today as we sit here today, I know uh, there's a lot of things that go into this bill and we study a lot of things. And as we, we've heard of, of many different types of pollutions and things that we've studied, studied before, you know, there's air pollution, water pollution. We've heard of light pollution and sound pollution. And as we sit here today in our beautiful capital, we've got a new kind of emerging issue that is a pollution or maybe a pollutant today, and that's the vibration pollution. We're hearing from across the street of the... Uh, the new office building we're building over there makes it a little hard to concentrate sometimes. So do you think uh, maybe in, under the emerging issues they could study the vibration pollution of our uh, friends across the street building that new building, Senator Hur? Senator Hur, to the question. Uh, yeah, I uh, appreciate that, uh, that proposal. Of course, that will have to go through. I would ask that Sen Senator Icorn um, propose it for next round of LCCMR about that. Uh, I'm very enlightened by your question, uh, Senator, Senator Eichhorn. Bring a lot of humor to me. Senator Eichhorn. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Hurst. So I won't have an amendment today, but just wanted to have a little fun and bring light to that as, as we're talking with some of our other colleagues in the, in the retiring room about that as well. And be happy to be done with that part of it. But thank you for answering the questions and indulging me and having a little fun today, Senator Hur. Members, Thanks. we're on House File 3377. If there's no other amendments, I'm going to go to third reading. Okay. Are you okay on third reading? All right. I wanted to make sure. Anyone else? If not, the Secretary will give House File 3377 third reading. House file number 3377, a bill for an act relating to natural resources, appropriating money from Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund. Third reading, Senator Dames. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. And would Senator Hur yield? Senator Hur, will you yield? He will he yield. Senator, uh, Senator Hur, Dames. Senator Hur, I see that you have, uh, that the, the bill has 47 projects and there's a map here shows what part of the state they're in. Can you tell me how many projects were requested? How many grants were requested through projects? Senator Hur, to that question. Um, Mr. President and Senator Dame, I believe the information has been passed to you as well, and I'm um, 
dig into that piece of paper that has the pie chart uh, that has the total number of proposal. Here, I see it now as 218 proposal received. Uh, would Senator Hur continue to yield? Senator Dames, uh, Senator Hur, will you, will you yield for another question? He will yield. Senator Dames. Uh, thank you, Mr. President and Senator Hur. So there's 200 and some projects. Can you tell me the process you went through to get down to the 47 projects? Senator Hur. Thank you. Uh, Thank, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Dame. I would think that maybe you have, will have better answer than I do, be, being that you are, uh, have been a longtime member of the LCCMR, and there's a uh, process where we um, uh, hear all the bill proposed and then later uh, give uh, time for each member to score them, and then uh, there will be a breaking point where all the uh, all the scoring from members are tally up, and then uh, we they we will hear presentation one more time on those projects that make through the uh, make through the uh, breaking point line. So uh, uh, and then decide what what else to drop drop or leave it in to the LCCMR project. Senator Dames. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Would Senator Hur continue to yield? Senator Hur, will you yield? Senator Hur will yield. Senator Dames. Uh, Senator Hur, uh, maybe I could be a little more direct in my question. Was the LCCMR committee, the full committee, involved in the elimination of all of these projects down to the 47? Or were there, was there a small group that decided that? Was any of this just decided by the uh, agency itself? Can you tell me uh, basically if the LCCMR committee was involved in all of the eliminations to get down to the 47 projects? Senator Hur. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Dame. Uh, just one correction is uh, unless Senator Dame uh, referred to something uh, some other project, but the, the project that uh, made it out of the gate is, uh, is about 100 projects, 101 to be exact, uh, not 47. Uh, so um, to answer your question, we did have a very good attendance uh, every time, and hybrid actually helped us to uh, keep our attendance in, in perfect. So. Um, throughout everyone are part of the process. Senator Dames. Uh, thank you, Mr. Or Madam, or Mr. President. Would uh, Senator Hur continue to yield? Senator Hur, will you yield? He will yield. <laughs> Senator and, Dames. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Senator Hur. So this map shows there were 47, well, I'm sorry, it is 101, 47, and, okay, statewide. So the 101 projects, that uh, to get down to that number, that was all decided by the full committee. Is that what I'm hearing? Senator Hur, to the question. Uh, Senator Dames, that is correct, uh, by um, supermajority. Senator Dames. Uh, thank you, Senator Hur, and thank you, Mr. President. Any other discussions? We are on final passage of House File 3377. Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I got a few things uh, to talk about. I, I want to uh, say I appreciate Senator Hurst sending out this uh, uh, sheet of paper here that talks a little bit about the projects and, and what uh, these funds are supposed to be used for. And it actually says on here these funds must be used to protect, conserve, preserve, enhance Minnesota's air, water, land, fish, and wildlife um, and for the benefit of everyone. And this is the, the first time I was able to serve on the, on the LCCMR committee. It was, it was enlightening. Uh, and, you know, we talk about, uh, first I'll address the issue that uh, Senator Hurt talked about, the integrity. He didn't want to uh, compromise the integrity of the committee. I think is some, some words like that. But the fact is, uh, we can make changes here. The committee is to make recommendations, and that's what they do. And the legislature is the one that passes those recommendations or does not. So the integrity lies here. And one of the problems that I've had with this and other, other bills to the, of the dedicated funds 
is that most people never look into what these bills really are. They don't know, they don't know the, the projects. They don't know what was eliminated through votes, uh, what, was, what was moved forward. And there's a huge pan, uh, booklet that I used to get, and I couldn't get it this year, so I had to do this all on computer, so some of my stuff was a little scattered. But these are, these are complex issues. And each one of these projects has about three pages in it. And it tells what they're going to do with the money, uh, how they're going to uh, move forward or not, uh, who's getting the money, who's getting funded. Is it going for a project or is it going to uh, personnel? And much of this money does go to personnel. Uh, in, in this bill, there is, uh, uh, as Senator Hur said, just under $80 million, 79 point some million dollars. And 35% of that goes to state government, goes back into state government through agencies. And some of the, um, some of the things that they do is they'll study and they'll study, and they'll study. And you don't see hardly any projects on the ground that actually come to fruition. Uh, even the ones that they, they do put into a project will be phase one, phase two, phase 16. And it never ends. And what is, uh, I believe that what we're seeing here is a slush fund that keeps agencies and our university uh, in dollars, in state dollars. And I don't see a lot of uh, um, a lot of conclusions to the studies and, and the projects that they're doing. Now, in the in the paper that the senator put out, he's got three um, three projects here: one for wild rice, uh, one for PFAS, and one for uh, avian influenza. And those are those are probably good projects. I'm not going to deny that. But that's three out of 101. And so I'd like to go a little bit into some of the stuff that, that uh, you're not going to see here. And uh, for the state government, there was just under a million dollars, $933,000, to study and count elk. We've got elk, elk bills going through. We're making decisions on elk. We're going to expand the herds on elk, uh, and we're going to uh, reduce the, the payments to, uh, for damages elk cause. And yet we're still, so apparently we haven't even done the studies because we're going to spend a million dollars on that and we're already making decisions that's going to hurt our, our landowners and our farmers. I don't know that the DNR needs another million dollars to study elk. They should have had that information. They can tell you how many there are. They can tell you where they're coming from. They can tell you if they're jumping back and forth between here and Canada. So what they're going to use the other million for is anybody's guess. There's 1.8 million dollars in here to the to the state government to fund field guides and there's 3.2 million dollars for groundwater atlases do you know how many millions of dollars we've stuck into groundwater atlases in many different areas they keep coming up and up and up and i don't know we must have a stack of groundwater atlases somewhere because we've done a lot of them and those are just three on, on the state government. But the state government's 35% of this bill. Over $28 million goes to state government. The other issue with this is the university and colleges. Almost $26 million to university and colleges. And, and this, and I've listed just a few here uh, on these. There's 300, just about $350 million the university came forward. They want to study crevices in trees. Uh, $199,000 to connect habitat to insect prey. Phase three of the Voyager's Wolf Project. What do wolves eat in the summertime? Almost a million dollars. And that's phase three. Doesn't count what they got in phase one and two. Uh, $400,000. How many weasels are in Minnesota? Just about $700,000. How did deer move around the metro area? $1.2 million for more water atlases that we're going to add to the 3.2 that we just gave the DNR. Uh, visitor, uh, visitor perceptions of water. 
So we're going to interview people that go to the lake and say, what do you think about this water? But that's only $379,000. So uh, we're going to spend $470,000 to battle jumping worms. $415,000 to study to see if tree diversity can increase community diversity. $525,000 to develop technology to help prevent wildlife fatalities from wind turbines. And this is just part of it. And so the, the projects that we see, yes, they go through a vetting process. But these are the projects that came out of that vetting process. And I wonder sometimes if the people of Minnesota actually know what this money is being spent for. I really do. Is this what they voted for when it comes to clean water? Some of the projects that were passed up, which I think that we've been trying to get in here for years, is if you really want to fight pollution, you go to point source uh, uh, pollution areas, which is city water, city sewer, or city sewer in, in, in general, that we uh, change our regulations every time the MPCA decides they want to, cost our cities millions and millions of dollars to upgrade these, and yet in a bill that's supposed to be for clean water, we never see those in here. They're just always, always dumped out. And I just think people have to ask themselves, uh, what's not included in, in this bill, this $80 million a year, what's not in here, and is this what you voted for? I'm going to be going out this summer because this is going to be on the ballot next year. And I'm going to be asking people if these are the kind of projects that they voted for. And if not, maybe we have to consider a different use for our lottery funds. I'm not going to go uh, into too much more, except I'm going to leave you with this and let other people talk. We are in a constant state of not enough funding around here. We spend billions of dollars, but we never have enough, never have enough, never have enough. We're short in our schools. We're short in our nursing homes. We're short everywhere. And yet, we can uh, spend $1.8 million to up, up, update field guides, or seven, uh, $700,000 million, $700, to count deer in the metro area. Something's drastically wrong. It just is. Um, I don't support the bill. I'm glad that I'm on the committee, I'm, I'm learning a lot, uh, but it hasn't really changed my view of how we're spending precious uh, dollars that the people of Minnesota, I think, thought we're going for something else. Members, as a reminder, we are on House File 3377, Final Passage. I am now going to Senator Westrom. Mr. President, i um, wondering if the author of the bill would yield for a few questions. Senator Hur, will you yield? He will yield. Senator Westrom. Uh, Mr. President, uh, Senator Hur, can you uh, talk to us about the dollars that are in here for wastewater or optimizing or improving wastewater uh, for cities and communities? Uh, talk to us a little about that, those efforts and those proposals. How many of them are in here and what are they going to be doing? Senator Hur, when you're ready. Senator Herr. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Westrom. Um, there are 13, uh, 16 recommendations that deal with uh, improving our quality of water, protect and restore water and habitat in, in, in our uh, LCCNR bill here, Senator Westrom. Senator Westrom. Mr. President, uh, specifically if Senator Herr Her would yield. Senator Herr, will you yield? He will yield. Senator Westrom. Mr. President, uh, Senator Herr, thank you. Uh, of those projects, how many are going to help uh, wastewater projects or uh, research or specific projects uh, for wastewater? And Senator and Herr. Much, and how much, Mr. President? Uh, uh, Mr. President, Senator Westrom, there are a total of four that are uh, associated with wastewater. Senator Westrom. And Mr. President, uh, Senator Herr, if you would continue to yield. Senator Herr, will you yield? Yes. He will yield. Senator Westrom. So, Mr. President, Senator Herr, uh, thank you for that. Uh, can you remind uh, the Senate 
how many, uh, what those projects generally are doing and how many dollars we're going to be spending to uh, help research or optimize uh, wastewater treatment uh, in our state? Senator Herr. Thank, thank you, Senator Westrom. Allow me a few minutes to uh, look at the language and I can share that with you. Thank you, Senator Herr. Take your time. Mr. President, uh, I'm happy to uh, Senator let Westrom. others talk and come back if uh, Senator Hurd needs a few minutes. Uh, say what you just said again. One more time, Senator Westrom. S say that again, Mr. President. That's correct. <laughs> Can you say it again? I didn't hear oh, you. Okay. I, I said, uh, Mr. President, I'm, I'm happy to sit down and let others continue with debate if Senator Hurd needs a few more minutes to uh, familiarize himself with those those that we were talking about. Sounds good, Senator Westrom. Uh, and I, I promise to come back to you, Senator Westrom, so that Senator Herr can answer the question. Any other debate or discussion on House File 3377? Senator Jaskowski. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thanks for the bill, Senator Herr. Um, Senator Herr members, I share some of Senator Green's same sentiments. Um, we have seen these bills over time uh, really meander into areas that are not what the people of Minnesota envisioned when they voted uh, to set aside these lottery dollars uh, for the environment. Um, some of them, and I'm just going to pull out one provision that Senator Green didn't mention, and Senator Herr, I, I'm, I'm not going to ask you to yield, but if you would simply write down and consider Senator Herr, and I'll, um, I can talk to you about this. Uh, lines 5.5 and 5.6 on the bill. Um, but we have an item here brought forward by the one of the 35% of the bill. Um, I think Senator Green was talking about 35% of the bill includes the government. The government is the organization spending the money here. So we are using this money to underwrite government. And they bring forward here the foundational data for moth and butterfly conservation. Now, members, uh, I think it could be argued, um, and many Minnesotans might argue, that they want to have a comprehensive list of Minnesota moths and butterflies, because that, that is what the bill calls for. And uh, going back to Senator Wiesenberg's definition of what science is, I would say members, Mr. President, that that's science. Developing a comprehensive list and understanding, the, you know, the populations of moths or butterflies. But the product of this, of this list coming from the LCCMR group, the, the, their recommendations also includes in the same language to, it should be used also to inform land managers, which I guess maybe we could inform land managers and let them know here's a comprehensive list and this is what they look like. But members, it goes further and says, to facilitate public appreciation of these species. Now, Mr. President, some people don't like moths and butterflies. Some people like butterflies, some don't like moths. Some might like elk. Some might like weasels, some might like snakes, some might not like snakes. But Mr. President, members, should it be the policy of this legislature and of this government, and remember this was, proposal was written by government, to almost be activist in what we are spending this money for? In other words, we're going to put together the comprehensive lists of moths and butterflies, and then we're going to try to get people to like them. That's what this says. An activist component to the policy here, and I don't know, Senator Hur, you probably didn't intend that, maybe did, as did maybe none of the other legislators on the LCCMR group, but this is the product we have before us. So I would just ask Senator Hur, as you go to conference with this bill, 
Um, take a look at that, those two lines. That sh I should have probably had an amendment to pull that out. Um, and look at other parts of the bill. If we're going to do these things, let's make them based on science. Let's not have a bill that spends the people's money to try to tell the people what they should like. Because, Mr. President, that's what those several words in this particular provision call for. Thank you, Mr. President. I believe that Senator Hur is now prepared. Senator Hur. Thank you, Mr. President. I do have to answer for Senator Westrom. But, uh, just uh, touch, touching base with uh, Senator Drakowski's Dr Dr um, uh, remark, I uh, just want to add on that we do have citizen members in our, uh, in our LCCR committees. Uh, so earlier I did say um, we have a total of five members and that are appointed by the governors. Um, Senator Westrom, to your answer, that the uh, the total amount is close to a million, a little over a million dollars, in aggregation of two project. Um, to be specific, is line 12.4, uh, enhancing wastewater treatment through genetic sequencing, and line 13.2, uh, novel nutrients recovering process from wastewater treatment plants, and there are section in the bill that ex uh, give extension to, uh, out to the previous project. Senator Westrom. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, thank you, Senator Herr, and uh, appreciate highlighting that as a part of the bill. You've heard some criticism of this bill, Senator Herr. Uh, these are some com parts of the bill that are beneficial uh, that I want to have members be aware of and also talk about. Uh, if it were up to me, we'd be doing more for helping treat and clean up wastewater uh, with some of these environmental funds that are supposed to go towards protecting and improving and enhancing the environment. But uh, these, are, uh, these are good projects that we were able to fund. And so, uh, Senator Herr, part of the reason I also want to bring this up to people's attention and those listening on TV the effort that's going to go forward next year, or this year on the ballot, I think it's this year, this fall, is to renew the Environmental Trust Fund. But that language, unfortunately, is going to make it harder to help clean up wastewater with some of the Environmental Trust Fund dollars. And so uh, we've got dollars in this bill. I support those dollars. Uh, you've supported them. The Senate should support those projects and others like it, uh, but members, uh, we're making a big mistake with what we did last year to try to limit or eliminate uh, wastewater cleanup or assistance to our cities or wastewater projects uh, to be funded out of the Environmental Trust Fund, which is to help the environment. It's kind of an oxymoron, kind of a uh, a dilemma or a dichotomy that we're using all these funds for cleaning up the environment, but uh, the Democrats last year didn't want to clean up wastewater, and so they're going to try to have the voters pass something this fall that will eliminate or nearly eliminate using uh, environmental trust funds, the lottery funds, from helping our communities with a problem everybody has, which is always treating and improving and cleaning the wastewater that goes through the septic systems that affects every household. And so uh, I'm glad we've got this in here, Senator Herr. We still have time to fix the wrongs that were uh, done last year, and hopefully the voters this fall will, will send the message and uh, we'll get a chance to, to, to correct that again when the amendment this fall fails, because it should fail uh, with the uh, language that passed last year, eliminating or nearly eliminating the help of wastewater, which was something that the original language passed would allow and did allow and actually called out specifically for rural wastewater. And so uh, we've got that in this bill. We've had it in some bills before, as Senator Hur just announced, uh, talked about. We've got some projects that we're working on. The LCCM has funded. We're extending those deadlines on those projects so they can do good work for our communities and cleaning up wastewater and research 
and the technology that is available for um, our communities when they're trying to um, improve with the wastewater, which uh, uh, it's, it's a great thing if you take wastewater, i.e. sewage, have a process, mechanical or natural, clean it up and then you can discharge it back into the waters, lakes, waters of the, of the state, which is what happens in most communities. And it has to happen, because everybody has to go. But the Democrats last year are trying to eliminate that. I'm glad we've got it in this bill uh, still, and hopefully we can continue on this pro these projects in the future. Senator Hur, one last question if you would yield. I will yield. Senator Hur, will you yield? He will yield. Senator Westrom. Uh, Mr. President, uh, Senator Hur, uh, can you uh, just highlight any differences in this bill from the House bill at one point uh, that seemed like both bills were passing very similar or, or the exact same? Are we on the track that they're quite similar yet? Or how many differences are there and what's the likelihood that there will be a conference committee? Or if they're the same, is it likely there's not a conference committee? Senator Hur, to the question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Senator Westrom, they are the, the, the two bills are the same. It's identical. Senator Westrom. So, Mr. President, uh, thank you, Senator Hur. So if I understand correctly, Senator Hur, if this bill passes this the way it is today, there will not be a conference committee. This just goes directly to the governor's desk upon the House passing it, or have they already passed it? Senator Hur. Uh, Senator Westrom, uh, this, this is a concur bill uh, of the House, and so once it's passed, this body will go to the governor. Senator Westrom, seeing no further questions, any other questions before we have our final comments from the House, excuse me, from the Senate author? Seeing none, Senator Hur, for final comments before uh, we vote. Thank you. Thank you, members, for very, very um, insightful uh, discussion. You know, um, it's pretty much boiled down to the presentation and what, what we need to be nitpicking on. Uh, from the side, from the positive side of this bill, we appropriate 28 recommendations for the foundational natural uh, resource data information and 13 recommendations for water resource, uh, 22 recommendations for environmental education, uh, four recommendations for aquatic and terrestrial invasive species, and five air quality, climate change, and renewable energy, 16 project uh, recommendations to protect and restore land and water and habitats, and 10 recommendations to protect our endangered wildlife and expand our rec recreational area. From this standpoint, we for sure will vote for the ballot in November, and let alone the survey that people take at the state fair, we uh, do have 88% approval rate of supporting the ballot this, no, this November. Uh, so let me shine some light on that. I know that um, the subject of jumping warren did come up. That's an invasive species, and that's what this bill is about to make sure that um, our, for, our natural forest, our natural uh, forest, our ecosystem are not uh, in danger or not contaminated with in, invasive species. So that's that's critical. Uh, for the bill to be, and I appreciate members who, who um, are part of this bill and all, all, all this, our citizen um, appointees as well. And before I close, I just want to acknowledge our co-chair of this uh, LCCR uh, committee and also uh, the drafting of this bill, uh, our Chair uh, uh, Representative Hansen, who's uh, co-chair with me, and also citizen appoint chair N N Nancy Gibson and many others who are part of the committee. I also want to thank member of the Environment, my Climate and Legacy Committee, um, my, uh, Vice Chair Sarah McCune, and ranking member Justin uh, Senator Justin Icorn, who uh, has been a good partner with me in at time. Uh, uh, 
at time uh, softened me down a little bit into, into humor. Uh, and also I appreciate Senator Green, uh, Senator uh, House Child, Senator Hoffman, Senator Kunish, Senator Lane, Senator Morrison, and Senator Wiesenberg, who also sit in the Environment Committee where we review this and then now uh, send it to the floor here for your uh, approval. And hopefully we can get super majority for this bill uh, in, in passing. I also want to thank the staff as well, uh, my, my staff here and also the council staff like uh, Mr. Ben, ben Stanley and Mr. Daniel Bueller and Carla uh, Josephson, Cassie and our researcher and so forth. And uh, Ms. Nash was also here with us. So hope for your green vote, members. Thank you. Members, the secretary will take the roll on final passage of House File 3377. Members, please vote. Senator Kunis, for those voting pursuant to Rule 40.7. Mr. President, Senator Port votes yes. Senator Port votes aye. And Senator Dietzik votes aye. Senator Dietzik votes aye. Senator Jasinski, for those voting pursuant to Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Duckworth votes aye. Senator Duckworth votes aye. Thank you, Mr. Uh, President. Senator Miller votes no. Senator Miller votes no. All senators having voted who desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 41 ayes and 25 noes, the bill is passed and its title agreed to. <laughs> Members, we will now proceed to the 13th order of business, announcements of Senate interests. Without objection, the following senators will be excused from today's session. Nelson, 115 to 130, Lang, Two o'clock until the end. Any other announcements of Senate interest? Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise today to recognize the passing of a statesman and a hero from Ottertail County, former Senator Cal Larson. Uh, Senator Larson served in the Minnesota House, first being elected in 1966, serving eight years in that body. He was then elected in 1986 to the Minnesota Senate, where he would serve for 20 years. Senator Larson made very, a very big impact in our community. He helped establish the Fergus Falls Veterans Home and Glendalow State Park, and he was instrumental in opening the door to the first Minnesota High School League girls sports. Senator Larson was known for his bipartisan work and lasting friendships with his colleagues. Firstly, Senator Larson was a loving husband, father, and grandfather. He was beloved by his family, and they were always his greatest priority. And so, Mr. President would ask uh, for a moment of silence to recognize the life and service of Senator Cal Larson. And before we stand for that moment of silence, I think Senator Marty wanted to say something about uh, this wonderful senator that has been highlighted. Senator Marty. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Rasmussen. Yes, Cal Larson was a wonderful senator. I think members of both parties saw him as fair and honorable, and he was proud of his Norwegian heritage. He always, on sitting to my, my day, brought in Norwegian goodies. Um, but somebody we all trusted and loved, and I um, want to thank Senator Rasmussen for bringing this up and joining in the moment of silence. Before we go to the moment of silence, uh, Senator Farnsworth, were you going to speak to the senator, or did you have a different uh, announcement? Senator Farnsworth. 
Thank you, Mr. President. I have a different announcement. Senator Westrom, were you going to speak to the, uh, the salute? Uh, Senator Westrom. Mr. President, uh, I too just want to uh, add our condolences and sympathies to the Cal Larson family, somebody that I worked with closely as a neighboring uh, district to my district all the years I've served uh, that overlapped when uh, Senator Larson served. He was certainly a mentor to myself, Representative Bud Nornis, a close friend of his as well. And uh, members, Cal, uh, even though he left here, if many of you remember the Wednesday morning breakfast with Cal downtown at the downtowner uh, went on for many years, just ended a few years ago. And so, Cal, I, was, uh, I, remember, I remember that well. Cal was always interested in what was happening here at the Capitol and in our state and uh, stayed very active up till the end. And so uh, our, our deepest sympathies, but certainly a great loss for the state of Minnesota. And before the moment of silence, I'm going to recognize Senator Limmer. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I, too, served with Cal Larson, and uh, uh, along with John Marty and a few other of our senators in the room, uh, not too many of us that have served with Cal Larson, but one thing that I wanted people to know outside of his public life, he's very proud of his family. His family, Laura, her husband, Tommy, um, Jill, and uh, Peter, Peter Larson, um, they were all uh, uh, involved in the lobbying work, so they were very close to Cal as being a state senator. And oftentimes, uh, we'd meet the whole family in Cal's office. He's very proud of his family, as well as very proud of his community up near uh, Fergus Falls in the Otter Tail County area. Just uh, a, very, a very compassionate family man very proud of his family as well as his role in the Minnesota Senate. Uh, he really embodied a citizen legislator that oftentimes seems to be a losing element in, in the complexion and the profile of the Minnesota legislature, but nevertheless, uh, he will be missed. Very jovial guy, easy to talk to, and often a guy who would bridge the gap between the far and the other far on the other side of the political spectrum. So he truly was a person that will be missed and someone that could easily be modeled after if you're looking for someone to follow as a good legislator that wants to do the very best for the state of Minnesota. And before we go to our moment of silence, Senate Minority Leader Mark Johnson. Thank you, Mr. President. And Although Cal was known as Mr. Uh, Fergus Falls, I do get to claim part of him. He, uh, he was up in Northwest Minnesota uh, long before I knew him. Uh, he was born and raised up that way, and, and Badger and his dad was, uh, worked at, with the railroads up there, so was, we had that, co that uh, connection. But uh, one of the first people that I met, former senators that I met when I came down to the Senate, uh, was Cal Larson. I went down to Kellogg Square to see if I could rent a place there and I was wandering through the Skyway and I ran into this friendly guy and we were talking as we were walking uh, through the Skyway and, and here it turns out to be Cal. And Cal asked me every question under the sun, you know, what my wife's name is, what, her, what my father-in-law did, what I did. And every time that I met Cal, he would go down the, down the whole list. Oh, how is, how is your father-in-law Lee doing? How is your wife doing? How are the kids doing? And he was genuinely curious, curious about every aspect of my life and the life of those people that I care about. And that's what really reflected on him. I mean, it was him, it was his kids, it was his grandkids and his wife. Just such a genuine man. So what a great loss for this state. But uh, remember, I'll remember Cal very fondly. Seeing that all salutes have been communicated, uh, will you please be so kind as to stand so we can do a moment of silence for former Senator Larson. Thank you, Senators. 
Any other announcements of Senate interest? Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. President and members. Uh, I know it's a little early, but I want to get the date on your uh, books uh, for the I-90 Highway 14 celebration of Southern Minnesota. Uh, the date is Wednesday, May 8th. It's at the CHS Field. Uh, uh, last year it wasn't as uh, well attended as we wanted, so I hope that uh, we can come together across party lines. I know people like Senator Larson and Senator Tomasoni uh, really encourage that to uh, get together uh, in a bipartisan way. I know it's towards the end of session. Things sometimes get a little tense around here, and it's a good way to uh, celebrate, to get together the friendships that we'll always uh, maintain through the uh, legislature. And I'll talk with Senator Frentz again, and we'll work on that date to make sure nothing controversial comes up on the agenda, I hope. We'll give it another shot, Senator Frentz friends, and we'll see how you do this year. Uh, but I hope you can all attend, and it really is a good event, so I hope you can all make it. Senator Farnsworth. Thank you, Mr. President. And uh, about halfway between now and the I-90 party, we also have the Ranger Party. So the Iron Range delegation would like to invite you on April 17th to the Ranger Party at Mancini's. Uh, a couple of things about this. Normally in the past, we haven't done this for a few years, but in the past there has been a charge. Uh, there is no charge, but we will have... Um, uh, uh, encourage donations to the Senator Tomasoni ALS Foundation, and we'll have QR codes so that you can do that with your phone. Um, but all of the proceeds, so we have sponsors that are paying for the whole night, so all of the proceeds from that will go to Senator Tomasoni's ALS Foundation, and that is going to be hosted by the best delegation in the entire legislature, the range delegation. So we hope everybody can attend. Senator Herr. Uh, members, just want to um, announce that uh, the Environment, Climate, and Legacy Committee will start in 30 minutes from now, 3.30. Thank you. Senator Pappas. Thank you, Mr. President. I promise this is the last time I'm going to remind you about the Legislative Theater Party tonight. Reception at 6.30, play at 7.30. You can still get tickets at the door. We have some reserved for you. The play is called A Unique Assignment, and it's gotten grave reviews. A History Theater is at 10th and Cedar, so it's very close to here. Senator Hoschild. Thank you, Mr. President. I just want to join Senator Farnsworth and the other range delegates to encourage you to come to the Ranger Party. Thank you. Senator Fate. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I just wanted to announce that the Committee on Higher Education will be meeting immediately after session. Thank you. Any, uh, any other announcements of Senate interest? I want to make sure that I don't leave out anyone before I recognize Senator Murphy. Seeing none, Senator Murphy. Thank you, Mr. President, uh, Senator, Senator Murphy, a proud member of the St. Paul delegation, which includes Senator Pappas, who was born in Hibbing, making her a ranger. We're everywhere. Uh, members, uh, next week we will be meeting on Monday and Thursday. Monday we'll convene at 11. We will break on Tuesday at 5 p.m. for Eid. We will come back on Thursday at noon at the end of the Eid celebration. Just want people to know, and I think the email about what we're taking up next week is already in your mailboxes. With that, Mr. President, I move that the Senate do now adjourn until Monday, April 8th at 11 a.m. On that motion, all in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. The Senate is now adjourned. <laughs>